Good evening. This is the fourth of five public hearings on the fiscal year 25 operating budgets and FY25 to 30 public services program and fiscal policy for Montgomery County Government, Montgomery College, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, WSSC Water, and Montgomery County Public Schools. Council committees will conduct work sessions on the budgets beginning Wednesday, April 10th, and full council work sessions will begin on Monday, May 6th. The committee schedule is available on the council's website. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. You will hear a tone when your time is up. We have a very large number of speakers registered to speak, so we appreciate everyone abiding by their allotted time. Also a reminder to please refrain from applause and approving or disapproving of an individual's testimony. Everyone who is registered to speak has and should be afforded the opportunity to testify before us and before the public, so please refrain from interrupting or creating distractions. Also, per our rules for the hearing room, please do not hold up signs that will block anyone's view, and please keep the aisles clear so that people can enter and exit and so that our staff can do their jobs. Council members Fonny Gonzalez and Mink are attending the public hearing virtually. Also, before we open it up to speakers for the public hearing, I did want to take a moment to thank Jill Gable and the Legislative Information Services team for working so hard to coordinate all of our speakers. We're going to be up to 240 speakers after tonight's public hearing, and we'll have more tomorrow afternoon. It's an enormous task to take on, and just want to express our appreciation to them for their hard work in coordinating and appreciate members of the public for your patience as they navigate through that. Uh, with that, thank you to our great team, and we will uh, uh, move forward with our public hearing, starting with our first panel, Judd Ashman, Mayor Monique Ashton, Jim Brown, Wolver Mata, Stephanie Milovic, and Karen Morgret. Mayor Ashman, you have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the Council. I'm Judd Ashman, Mayor of the City of Gaithersburg, here to speak on behalf of the City. Last fall, um, as you know, due to County Police Department staffing shortages, the County Police, MCPD, made the decision to stop taking calls for service in Gaithersburg and Rockville, both of which have their own police departments. Since that time, our two municipalities have been working with the county to bring about funding reimbursement for the services that the county would have provided, but is now on us to provide. And with appreciation to all of you, we've made progress. However, this testimony is a continuation of that conversation. Uh, we have two asks. The first ask is for an increase to the budgeted amount of next year's payment for police services. While the proposed payment to Gaithersburg for police services in this FY25 budget is more than what was paid in the FY24 payment, it is less on a per officer basis by more than $18,000 per officer. In order to bring us on par with the FY24 formula, which I would argue is deficient to begin with, but we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, the county would need to increase this line item by somewhere around $347,000. The second ask is to share and discuss the county's reimbursement formula with us. Our staff has repeatedly asked for more information and transparency on this formula, but to no avail. We do know a couple things about this formula. It's based on the notion that the county could police the whole Gaithersburg jurisdiction with 19 personnel, which is not at all realistic. And to put this in perspective, as of July 1st, our Gaithersburg Police Department will be at 68 sworn officers, 19 and 68. Um, it's supposed to track county costs for police personnel, not only salary and benefits, but also equipment and vehicles. My question is, is the cost per officer at the county level going down this year? Of course it's not. That's kind of a laugh line. Um, so why would the cost per officer reimbursement for police services to the municipalities go down? Uh, without a more transparent explanation, municipalities like Gaithersburg and Rockville are unable to replicate the data to plan our respective budgets, and we're put at a disadvantage as we advocate tax fairness for our residents, who are also county residents and taxpayers. We should have a clear and complete account of how these figures were determined. In the short run, we ask that you increase our, our municipal police reimbursement line items accordingly. After the budget is passed, let's put all our cards on the table, share and discuss the formula, and find the most fair and equitable way forward. You guys are valued partners, and we appreciate the tough balancing act that you do to serve our county, and we stand ready to help. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mayor Ashton, you have three minutes. Good evening, President Friedson, our Vice President, and County Council Members. My name is Monique Ashton. I'm the Mayor of Rockville. I also serve as the President of the Merrill Municipal League Montgomery Chapter. Thank you for your time today. I, last time I came, I spoke about the historic opportunity that we had and what you all did to uh, pass expedited bill-22. It was something that was a long time coming, maybe 35 years or so, and I would accredit the body for really taking a bold step. In February of the Montgomery County chapter meeting, we learned that the totals that were included in that expedited bill were not fully coming to our municipalities. And it was concerning. As you know, many of us are in the midst of budget season and have already planned our budgets. And we're not operating with this level of funding that you all have. So every penny counts. Public safety is an incredible priority of our community. And we know that the county has needed our help and we need your help. We noted that, as I won't repeat everything that um, my Ash Twin has shared, um, but that the cost of policing has not gone down. It has gone up. But our formulas, cost per officer, are going down. It doesn't make sense. It's funny math, and something needs to be done. What we can see is that on the county level, you're going to be losing some officers of retirement, and we also know that some of those are senior seasoned officers. And so perhaps that's contributing to what looks like a lower cost per reimbursement. But we also know that you're making that up through overtime. And that is not factored into our formula. We cannot continue to take on more work and get less money over time. It doesn't work for us. We need to make sure this entire county is safe and we're willing to stand hand in hand with you. But we need to make sure we're adequately reimbursed. And we ask for that fix in this year, not in future years. So that is our first ask. In addition, uh, for the city of Rockville, the total reimbursement allocation was about 600000 less than what we were anticipating. And so we're just trying to now find ways to make that happen before we approve our budget by um, May. Police is a big part of that, and I want to advocate for all of the jurisdictions that have police. But I also will note that transportation is another area. It's a little bit of funny formulas that are going on. We're supposed to be reimbursed for traffic lights. And what we've seen is they've combined traffic lights and beacons, which we're not getting reimbursed for beacons. So the cost per reimbursement for traffic lights has gone significantly down. And so it's reducing what we're getting. We request that this get fixed. We were supposed to be getting the formulas, but we have not gotten them until today to be able to see this year to see what that is. So we ask for your help to fix this. Uh, I also just, I know there's a lot of school people in the room, so I want to support our school system. We, that's a stellar part of our county, support them. And then also let's come to the table to look at future funding for parks as well as police and transportation. Thank you. Thank you. President Brown. All right, everybody, thank you again for having me up here today. It's a great scene, everybody. Uh, I recognize all of you as partners, and I appreciate the knowledge and information that you've personally taken into uh, embrace what's going on in the Western County, is specifically in Poolsville, but in our entire region. I start off the theme with the word thank you, words thank you, and I appreciate you. Um, we created Fair Access in 2018, and uh, we did it for a reason because we knew that we had longstanding needs that weren't being addressed, and we really didn't have a way of effectively uh, communicating those needs and also turning them into provables. Uh, as a Fair Access Committee, in conjunction with the Town of Poolsville Commissioners and all of our support groups and groups that are uh, uh, basically uh, professional advocates alongside us, uh, you've listened. And I want to say to all of you, I really appreciate how you've listened. You've proven it with the new Poolsville High School. And as again, we opened it up this week to an unbelievable acclaim, applause. There were tears in people's eyes. This is a, truly an amazing moment that you guys created that touched people individually. and, and Come on up and see it in action. It's amazing to see the students are really, really excited about it. Um, you're on the verge of funding our regional community rec and health center. Uh, we know that's on the docket. And we thank you so much for your consideration and your, and your really listening. And listening has been a big deal for us. We didn't have people that listened before. You've listened. And you've become a part of our community by listening. We really do appreciate it. It's an initiative that has the banking of like one third of the county in terms of geography. I know that we have less people, but that doesn't mean that we count less. And you've done a great job of listening. We appreciate that. Now we ask you to fund something that's more, you've done a great job on bricks and mortar. 
keep up the good work. Uh, we'll always have more, but these are the big ones. You've already been addressing them. Um, our, our bricks and mortars have been funded, but now we have people funding that's needed. Uh, we come here tonight to talk about our line item request for funding for a health initiative. Um, it's a big deal for us. Again, our, our community, our partnership with you has shown that if you build it, we will come. And we need funding, but we're going to administrate it. We will be your partners. We will make a difference in people's lives through your funding, lives that you can drive right up to locals and sit down and see in action. We have it happening right now. We made the case. You've been listening. This is another case of please listen some more and help us out with this. It's a big deal. Uh, finally, are we done asking for things? No, not yet. Uh, we like a pool bubble. We know that will make a big difference in our world up there. Again, we're going to make the case. If you guys can help us out with the funding, we're going to do our share for that too. And I just approved our budget that puts in a pretty big line item to show that Poolsville is going to be a uh, play a role in that as well. So health funding, equitable, deserved, helpful to Poolsville, and something that you guys can see directly a result of. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Wolvermata. Good, good evening, members of Montgomery County. My name is Wilber Mata. I am testifying in support of funding to expand affordable housing in Montgomery County. I live in an apartment with my wife and my two kids. And I was testifying that in the pandemic, so I have a problem to pay my rent. Uh, the rent in Montgomery is so expensive now, so it's getting more expensive every single single month and the consequence now uh, i don't want to move from montgomery to another city because for example in my in my specific case so i have a child with the special needs and he's going to a school uh, in brown station school and they provide special needs because he, he is autistic and, and then, so I love Montgomery County because they provide me those resources for my kids and, and then please support funding for affordable, uh, affordable housing in this year budget. Families like me, my, my own, can continue to call Montgomery County. Thank you very much and God bless you everyone. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Stephanie Milovic. Hi, my name is Stephanie Milovich. I am the chair of the Montgomery Co uh, County Commission on Landlord-Tenant Affairs. Um, I'm simply here to be able to kind of testify and speak a little bit to what COLTA, as we call it, does, and just appreciation for the support that has been given thus far and what we may need continued going forward. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, the Commission on Landlord-Tenant Affairs is a quasi-judicial body. Uh, it's made up of 15 volunteers. It is made up of four landlord representatives, four tenant representatives, and four public members at large. We do not necessarily represent the interests of each category, but we each contribute our own unique perspectives to the hearings and cases that we hear. So every month we meet to be able to hear the different cases that are being brought forward that our investigators of the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs and the Department um, of Housing and Community Affairs investigate. Uh, every year these cases are going up. Um, so in this last year alone, uh, it's simply a situation that the complaints filed and assigned to investigators was 937 last year. And this year alone in 2024, here we are in April and we're already at 772. Uh, at this time, uh, again, in terms of last year, 40 cases were presented to Colta. These cases are brought forward if it's a situation that can't be reconciled within the investigators' investigations and or different sides disagree these happen. Um, many of these cases are the ones that are taken up by the commissioners. In these cases, the hearings often go three hours longer. The last one that I sat on lasted until well past midnight. So in these different situations, I'm really where the support can be given going forward um, is we always appreciate any funding and support that can be given to be able to assist um, simply uh, more investigators to be able to assist with the backlog of cases and complaints that are filed. Our investigators are doing a wonderful job in supporting and putting forth the cases that can't be reconciled, but more support is always appreciated. Uh, we are, of course, maybe seeing the influx as it relates to the Rent Stabilization Act. 
Um, so it may be something just to assist with the implementation of the new office going forward to ensure that different cases are addressed there and the different cases addressed with us. Uh, ultimately, we've been making great strides to be able to better support the county. Uh, last year, we implemented our first public awareness subcommittee and have continually worked along that front to help spread the word, especially when we have vacancies, um, to ensure that we are well staffed. Right now, we do have all 15 commissioner spots filled. Um, we hope to maintain that, especially with two new vacancies upcoming. Um, in terms of just the going forward, it's just simply something that we pride ourselves um, in terms of the Office of Landlord Tenant Affairs of uh, returning 99% of their calls within 48 hours, most within 24 hours, and we continue to hope to be the service that we are to the county. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Milovich. Uh, next speaker, Karen Morgert. Good evening, my name is Karen Morgert. I'm the acting chair of the Commission on People with Disabilities, here to testify on the 25, fiscal year 25 operating budget. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. Thank you for your support over the years. I'd like to start by saying thank you for creating the new IDD commission so quickly last year. That was record time. And the commission will be a big support to the IDD DD community. First, the CPWD supports the full request of 4.5 percent of the developmental disability supplement is requested by Interact IDD. The supplement is crucial now more than it has been in several years. Why? Approximately 4,000 individuals are currently receiving services and program expansion is expected as the state of Maryland implements the end wait initiative to pull individuals off the wait list. Direct support professionals hours have increased 4 percent to 6 million hours because of program growth and new program options for those served. As the, as the wait list is decreased, more service hours will be needed. Provider agencies continue to invest in recruitment and retention of staff. Wages are the highest in Montgomery County in the whole state, and provider agencies are mostly nonprofit, competing with large business that offer jobs to workers who go to work, do their job, and come home. Direct supports professionals, go to work, support individuals with disability to live, participate, work, in the community, dealing with human health, behaviors that are not predictable. In addition, DSPs often put their heart and passion in their work. It is not a job where you make widgets and go home. Second, the Commission on People with Disabilities supports pedestrian safety program. We recommend the county prioritize pedestrian safety over all other Montgomery County Department of Transportation projects. An average 400 people are struck by vehicles in Montgomery County annually. Sidewalk installation should be a top priority in all parts of the county with an emphasis on pedestrian safety above all modes of transportation on all Montgomery County Department of Transportation projects. The priority of sidewalk installation needs to be leading to schools where there are no bus service and must continue until all roads in Montgomery County are safe. This will require the county to take legislative action to make sidewalks mandatory and preventing homeowners from blocking sidewalk installation. The lack of sidewalks forces pedestrians, including children, to walk in the street among traffic and, that, and risk being hit. In closing, the CPWD thanks you for your time and consideration this evening. Thank you. That's all for this panel. We have our next panel, Bertila Fuentes, Hannah Hutton, Michael Ricci, Sylvia Howe, Jeff Chaputra, and Ellie Kleinman. Bertila Fuentes, you're ready. Mi nombre Please. es Bertila Avelar. Soy residente de Glenville Road, Silver Spring. Y yo estoy muy agradecida por vivir en esa comunidad. Y le doy gracias a los del condado porque me han ayudado muchísimo. Yo vivo con mi hija y con mis dos nietas. Una de mis nietas es especial. Ella va a la escuela Montgomery Dolls. 
y yo estoy muy agradecida porque el condado los ha ayudado muchísimo con lo, cuando estuvo la pandemia este yo no trabajé pero el condado me ayudó con la renta me ayudó con los biles y yo estoy muy agradecida yo ahorita he tenido una pérdida de mi hermana pero aquí estoy con la ayuda de Dios yo sé que voy a seguir adelante ella murió de cáncer no tiene ni un mes que falleció pero Dios me tiene aquí y Dios me va a dar la fuerza y yo estoy muy agradecida y les pido de que así como me han ayudado a mí pues hagan fondos para ayudar a más personas así como me han ayudado a mí yo les estoy muy agradecida y espero de que sigan ayudando a más personas como me ayudaron a mí gracias Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Bertila Avelar. I, I am a resident of Silver Spring and I have greatly benefited from having affordable housing. I am here to be a voice for those who are typically not heard and to advocate for additional funding in affordable ho uh, housing in the county. I have lived with my family in one of the Montgomery Housing Partnerships apartment communities in the Long Branch neighborhood for almost a decade. I live with my daughter and granddaughters. I have received a lot of assistance from the county. I recently lost my sister from cancer, and I am here to request for uh, additional help for families that, just like myself, need uh, the assistance. I have lost uh, my employment, but I am hopeful that I will find a new job opportunity soon. Uh, before uh, moving to an MHP property, I rented a room in White Oak area. Life is difficult, but it was even more difficult uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. Our condolences to your family. Our next speaker is Hannah Hutton. Hi, my name's Hannah. Uh, it's my first time speaking at one of these meetings. I'm going to take. I'm going to talk a little bit about the recreation and parks budget, and thank you all for your attention. My husband and I are both products of Montgomery County. As children, we played MSI soccer and went to a slew of Montgomery County recreation summer camps. As new college grads, we played flag football with Silver Spring Social Sports and softball at Wheaton Regional Park. Now that our team sport days are over, we utilize the local rec center for the exercise room at least once a week and we frequent the great acoustics and ales events on Elm Street Urban Park. In the spring, we look forward to paddleboarding at Black Hill Regional Park. The rec centers and parks are our third place, and we're so thankful for everything this county provides. Council members, today I sit in front of you uh, and support the proposed operating budget for Montgomery County Recreation Department. It's important that the recreation staff have the resources they need to serve our community efficiently and effectively. And thank you for producing a budget that will allow for this. Now it's hard to talk about recreation without bringing up parks. Montgomery Parks needs all of their requested funding to support the great events, events that bring our community together. An example of this is the new Sligo Creek Fest, Saturday, May 4th, 11 to 3. I hope to see you all there. <laughs> Parks need additional funding to improve environmental stewardship of natural areas and develop their workforce with improved customer service. Funding is needed to increase security at parks and trails to help keep parks safe for everyone. And finally, funding is crucial to speed up park construction projects. Our experiences in the parks are unforgettable, and I ask that you support increasing the Montgomery Parks budget by $4 million to fulfill the initially requested amount so that we can continue to enjoy our parks. We learn teamwork, flexibility, prioritization, and other critical skills for adulthood as children on our sports teams. Kids make new friends and minimize learning loss when they can participate in our summer camps. Our teenagers learn to care about this community through volunteer and work experiences with the Recreation Department's Teen Works and Summer Jobs programs. Seniors maintain independence for longer and stay connected with others when they participate in recreation programs. None of these things are possible without the first class parks and recreation programs that our county has to offer. And tonight I urge you to join me in advocating for the support of the proposed operating budget for our Recreation Department and to increase Montgomery Park's budget. 
Together, let us ensure that these community assets remain accessible and vibrant for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Michael Ricci. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening. Uh, I'm just here to uh, join Hannah and others in the community that are advocating that you fully fund both recreation and parks in the FY25 budget. It's important to us that these uh, great sister agencies have the resources they need to deliver the essential services they provide. I think as Hannah's comments show, these are not merely luxuries or amenities. They're not just you know, nice-to-haves. They're need-to-haves. They're indispensable to the quality of life that we cherish. The recent opening of the Silver Spring Aquatic Center is a testament to that. The recent announcement by the county executive that we're one of the healthiest jurisdictions in the nation is a testament to that. So it was definitely disappointing to us that in the budget proposal submitted to you, uh, the Parks Department faced a reduction of $4 million from its requested increase. And uh, as Hannah said, we're strongly urging you to rectify that and give them their full requested funding. There's a number of reasons for that, but one of the ways the shortfall manifests itself is it doesn't it means there's no operating funding for the new and expanded parks in the system and i know i know you're familiar there's uh, all of these main incredible projects here i'll just name a few uh... that are near and dear to my heart uh... broad run stream valley park project that's in poolsville uh... locals best cup of coffee in the county right yeah absolutely um, the ednor soapstone quarry special park acquisition that's in district five uh, an incredible project as well and uh, on behalf of my seven-year-old and five-year-old, the Caroline Freeland Urban Park uh, renovation by Bethesda Row. Um, they ask me every weekend when that's reopening. Um, some of you may know Caroline Freeland was literally a trailblazer. She was the first woman to chair the planning board back in the 60s and 70s. And in her time, uh, the parkland expanded to 16,000 acres. And today we're at over 37,000 acres and counting. But the key there is the end counting. That's not just a point of pride. It's the very point of conservation, right, is to keep going, to keep growing. And so by cutting the proposed budget, by making parks focus on just kind of what it has as opposed to what it wants to build to, it means they have to make reductions in services and look at not expanding some of the great programs that Hannah talked about that are very popular in the community and uh, defer maintenance. And so, um, you know, ribbon cuttings are nice. Rankings are great. Uh, press releases are nice. But uh, I think, as you know, true stewardship is a year-round commitment. It's about having a vision and seeing it through. It's about you know, making and counting count. It really is. And so I hope you will not let uh, fiscal short-sightedness win the day here. I hope you will fully fund, fully invest, and fully commit to recreation and parks. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Our next speaker, Sylvia Howe. Hello. OK. <sighs> My name is Sylvia Ho. And thank you, county council members, um, all of you, for granting me and more than 60 other speakers your attention this evening. I originally had another speech ready, but disturbing updates compelled me to write a new speech in the last two hours. So only six hours ago, there was a glowing group photo celebrating Autism Awareness Month. Well. Let me bring a new autism awareness. Diana Wiles plans to slaughter the other autism programs in MCPS. Darnstown was just the first parent group to learn of their program elimination and loss of autism trained staff. Paraeducators were involuntarily transferred during the school year. No, this is not Darnstown anymore. This just happened to a middle school autism program called ARS. No surprise, there's been no transparency in the process, and parents were the last to know. We respectfully ask for a private audience with some of you this and next week to counter those numerous lies and present to you facts and hard data from MCPS sources and our children's IEPs. Diana Wiles' office choked off enrollment for Darnstown and to this date refuses to show her methodology for projecting lower enrollment at Darnstown. Our hard data shows increased enrollment, doubling of size actually, and extreme popularity for our program. Look, you know what game MCPS is playing. As parents of autistic children, we need your help in stopping this reckless destruction of numerous autism programs that are benefiting our children, just because they need to satisfy budget cuts. 
Autistic children perform best when they receive specific learning programs through early, consistent intervention and instruction that match their needs. MCPS is willing to discriminate against a class of autistic students without due process of the special education budget. 68 disabled children, no wait, now it's hundreds of disabled children, were just told, don't expect fair treatment like your normal peers. You're too small and we don't care. And yes, there is evidence to back up that bold statement. First, she came for Darnstown. Now the middle school ARS. So ask MCPS, what autism program cut is next? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Our next speaker, Jeff Chaputra. Council presidents, council vice presidents, and council members, good evening and thank you for giving me a chance to speak at this public hearing. My name is Jeff Chaputra and I live in Gatorsburg. I'm here to speak about the elimination of some of the paraeducator positions and the conversions of the Autism Learning Center into traditional learning centers at my son's school, Darnstown Elementary. We were des devastated when we hear about these changes. As you know, the Darnstown Autism Learning Center is the only learning center that can accommodate autistic children who are two to three years behind their grade level and still working toward a high school diploma. Several years ago, when the MCPS team tried to determine to place my son in kindergarten, the coordinator of the traditional learning center told, my son, told me that my son is not a good fit for the traditional learning center, mostly because they don't have enough paraeducator to support him. His pre-K teacher, who believed in his potential, keep pushing the team to place him in a diploma-bound program. And again, Darnstown is the only diploma program, uh, autistic program that's diploma-bound in the county. That's when we met the coordinator of Darnstown Autism Learning Center, and she said that our son is a good fit for the program. I understand that MCPS is trying to expand the program to the whole county, and I applaud that effort. But they also said that the current students, including my son, will continue to receive the same level of service at Darnstown. That's what I'm at loss. How could they provide the same level of service while cutting half of the paraeducator in the program? So what will happen to my son now that MCPS reduced the support in his classroom? I'm worried that this change will set up my son to fail. He's only seven years old. Children have a right to a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. It, is that still the case after this cut the services? With this change, I can see some parents pursuing MCPS to send their children to private school, which may cost MCPS more in the long run. Also, some of these children may end up needing more resources from the county when they grow up. There is so much research that shows that investing in children early, regardless of their needs, is essential to their growth. With these cuts, MCPS is effectively shifting costs elsewhere to you guys so that they will end up needing more support and services later when they age up, when they grow up. Invest in these children now. Council member, please fight with us so we can help our autistic children to have a better future. I would also like to ask that the council and MCPS provide enough support for our special needs teacher so they are able to teach our autistic children. They are on the front line of this. Their passion is to teach special needs children. They should have proper paraeducator support to teach these children. I believe that the change that MCPS is implementing is not helping these te teachers and again setting them up to fail. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellie Kleinman. Good evening, distinguished members of the County Council. My name is Ellie Kleinman and I'm a school counselor at MCPS's highest farms rate elementary school in New Hampshire Estates in Silver Spring. Constituents don't always see the clear connection between votes and outcomes. For example, last year at this time, this body did not vote for the full $0.10 cent per $100 property tax increase that was proposed by County Executive Elridge. Instead, a $0.04 cent per $100 increase was passed. And this year, Mr. Elridge's budget proposal doesn't even fully fund the budget request proposed to the Council by the School Board. Admittedly, no one wants to pay higher taxes, and as a constituent myself, and an employee of MCPS, I certainly don't. But I understand that you get what you pay for. 
Seeing and hearing about the impact of your vote from last year and now projecting how the continued underfunding of MCPS will affect future outcomes for our students, including the very poorest of our students, disturbs and saddens me. Why? Because I see when high need special education students don't get the one-on-one -on -one paraeducator support or special programs they need. I see the impact that has not only on those students, but also on their classmates and others in the building. I see when our special educators work for free, hours into the night, when they should be spending time with their families. They make these sacrifices because they don't have enough staff to support their students and complete their paperwork during the workday. To make matters worse, one of our existing positions is scheduled to be cut for next year. I see when we don't have enough school psychologists and the impact that has on the workload of psychologists on loan to schools like ours who haven't had a school psych in two years. I see when our school's speech pathologist is so overloaded that she can barely get all her documentation done while trying to support 60 plus students whom she has to see twice weekly. I hear when other school counselors are so bogged down with 504 plans that they can't possibly meet the mental health needs of our students who so desperately need those supports. This is what I see and as someone who graduated from MCPS I ask myself can we do any better to ensure we're supporting the educational needs of our children? Our students and many others from across MCPS benefited from a program called CARES Tutoring funded by ESSER funds. The tutoring program was discontinued a year prematurely as a result of your decision not to pass the 10 cent property tax increase last year. At New Hampshire states we have data showing how CARES tutoring significantly improved reading levels for students with the lowest reading levels in the school. Just cutting that tutoring program alone had to negatively impact thousands of other students across MCPS just like our school. My fellow educators protested outside tonight to ensure that the needs of all MCPS students will be met by the decisions that you make today. Day. Let's not shortchange our students' future now to save a few dollars when we know that giving them the best education we can is essential to securing their future and enabling them to contribute to the economic engine of Montgomery County when they grow up. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel, Karen Hernandez, Juliet Kaleva Donev, Kelly Dominique Hudson, Raina Ochoa, Mark Disler, and Link Hoeing. Um, buenas noches, mi nombre es Karen Hernández. Como residente de vivienda as asequibles, testificaré esta tarde en apoyo a la financiación para preservar y ampliar las viviendas as asequibles en el estado, en el condado. Perdón. Durante la pandemia, mi esposo y yo contra contra el virus y hemos experimentado inestabilidad financiera a raíz de ellos nos atrasamos en el pago del alquiler durante más de cinco meses hasta que Montgomery House par, par, ¿cómo? Partnership. Uh, amable, amablemente nos brindó siete mil en asistencia para el alquiler por medio de recursos designados para residencia de la renta. Gracias a la ayuda que recibimos pudimos empezar de nuevo y seguir pagando el alquiler a tiempo. Nuestra residencia es una de las unidades de vivienda as asequible designadas por el programa de inversión del del condado con esta ayuda mi esposo que es el único sustento de nuestra casa ahora puede pagar el alquiler a tiempo y sin ningún problema además los programas extracurriculares ofrecidos por 
MHP han permitido a nuestros niños mantenerse enfocados en sus estudios mientras construyen a la comunidad a través de proyectos sociales, además los servicios sociales proporcionados por MHP nos ha dado acceso a asistencia alimentaria, lo que ha permitido a nuestra familia prosperar y superar numerosos obstáculos. Residir en un complejo de apartamentos operado por MHP le ha brindado a mi familia estabilidad, seguridad, brindándonos un lugar tranquilo y confiable para concentrarnos en nuestros esfuerzos para superarnos con el trabajo y la escuela. Me siento profundamente afortunada de haber encontrado en, en una casa segura y en un precio razonable. Sin embargo, soy consciente de que muchos... My name is Karen Hernandez, and as a resident of affordable housing, I will testify this evening in support of funding to preserve and expand affordable housing in the county. During the pandemic, my husband and I contracted the virus and experienced financial instability as a result. We fell behind on rent payments for over five months until Montgomery Housing Partnership kindly provided us with $7,000 in rental assistance through designated rent assistance resources. Thanks to the help we, re we received, we were able to start over and continue paying rent on time. Our residence is one of the affordable housing units designated by the county's investment program. With this assistance, my husband, who is the sole breadwinner of our household, can now pay rent on time and without any trouble. Additionally, the extracurricular programs offered by MHP have allowed our children to stay focused on their studies while contributing to the community through social projects. Furthermore, the social services provided by MHP have given us access to food assistance, which has enabled our families to thrive and overcome numeric uh, obstacles. I firmly believe everyone should have equal opportunities to reside in financially viable and secure housing. Therefore, uh, I urge the County Council to prioritize allocating sufficient funds for affordable housing. It is time to take action and ensure that everyone has access to a dignified place to call home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Julia Kalevodonov. You got it. You got it. No, one more time. One more time. You had it. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Julia Donev. I'm a senior director of finance and I'm a mother of four. My oldest son, Mateo, he is nine years old and he attends third grade at Darnstown Elementary Autism Learning Center. I'm here today to voice my objections and express my concerns regarding the decision to reduce paraeducator staff at Darnstown um, Learning Center. This program was specifically designed to educate children such as my son with higher functioning autism who do not qualify for the uh, highly restrictive uh, Montgomery County Public Schools autism program, however, significantly challenged by their disabilities to attend a traditional learn, learn, learning center program. My son's placement at Darnstown was not a random act. He was initially placed in a traditional learning center, not properly equipped to support the needs of children with autism. My son was left unattended for hours in school bathrooms, crawling through dirty bathroom floors from stall to stall without supervision of MCPS staff. He tried to escape the school on numerous occasions and I was frequently called into the school to pick him up. Um, the placement of my son in a traditional learning center was very disruptive to our personal lives, our work schedules, and it triggered severe anxiety for my son and for our entire family. Darnstown's Learning Center program differentiates itself from other MCPS learning centers as it provides specifically designed program for children with autism. Darnstown Learning Center has provided my son a chance of normalcy he never previously had. Since attending this school, my son's development has progressed, his speech has increased, 
He has gained the ability to communicate better, socialize, and even make friends. Paraeducators are a critical component of the Learning Center program at DES. They are the key to our children's success. Without them, our children would not be able to manage basic tasks and cope with challenging behaviors and transitions. The removal of paraeducators will create chaos and disruption in the DES Learning Center for students and for staff. This will deprive our children of the very supports they required to have the placement at the DES Autism Learning Center. Our children need additional supports and resources, not fewer. The decision to cut peer educator staff is going to further disable our already disabled children. It violates their legal rights to learn in a least restrictive environment. Children such as my son are unable to receive a free appropriate public education in a traditional gen ed classroom or in a highly restrictive self-contained autism program. Traditional learning center catered to children with all, sort, all sorts of developmental and learning delays. They are not designed and do not fit the needs of children with autism. The removal of DS Learning Center Autism Program leaves a large group of children, including my son, without proper program placement within MCPS. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Hudson. Esteemed County Council members, my name is Kelly Dominique Hudson. I am one of 250,000 black families living in Montgomery County. I'm here today as a concerned community advocate, bringing your attention to a critical issue, the disproportionate rate at which black children go missing and the current inadequacies with the Amber Alert system. Since moving to Maryland from Ohio with my two daughters, safety has been my number one concern. Transplanting here as a single mother whose support system remains in Ohio meant we had to start from scratch and creating a sense of community and a network of friends. Mariah and her son Chris were friends who became more like family. They're from New Jersey and they've lived in Montgomery County for 10 years. In September last year, after beginning 10th grade, Chris and Mariah moved to Northern Virginia. As usual, Mariah arrived home from work and awaited Chris's arrival from school. The holiday season, a new year, a total of four months, two weeks, and five days would pass before Chris came home. Chris had fallen in between the cracks of the current Amber Alert system. Imagine being terrified of heights. Now visualize yourself in the front seat of a roller coaster as it's inching higher and higher to its peak and then pausing before its final descent. That's how Mariah describes the feeling of having a missing child. Unlike Chris, 900 adolescents are still missing in Montgomery County. The current Amber Alert system, though effective, it fails to address the racial bias and other unique challenges faced by missing black children. Strict criteria result in many being labeled as runaways with little visibility in media coverage, delayed enforcement response and investigation time, a flaw that has proven tragic and perpetuates the cycle of unsolved cases. I urge you, esteemed county council, to fund and implement an ebony alert system which is designed to specifically address the racial disparities in missing children and missing children's cases. By adopting an ebony alert system, we can bridge the gap in media coverage, we can prevent delays in response time and rally the community to actively participate in searching for our black children. In January 2024, California's new law created an emergency alert system aimed to finding missing black youth between the ages of 12 and 25. California's progressive law underscores the urgent need for a more inclusive and effective alert system that prioritizes the safety and the well-being of all of our children, regardless of their background. And with your help, we can also champion this cause too. Let us act urgently by taking a crucial step towards the safe recovery of our community's children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Reina Ochoa. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Reina Isabel Ochoa. Agradezco la oportunidad que me han dado por estar aquí esta noche. Vengo a solicitar al, al, al Ejecutivo del Condado que dentro del presupuesto apoye el Departamento de Comunicaciones de la Iniciativa Latina de Salud. 
en el próximo año fiscal 2025. El motivo de mi solicitud es que como promotora de salud he da, me he dado cuenta que la responsabilidad de la elaboración de material que ellos han desarrollado en, en nuestra comunidad latina han ayudado mucho en el lenguaje y la cultura y con los servicios de acuerdo a sus necesidades. Um, también tenemos... Eh, eh, la iniciativa latina ha, ha ayudado mucho con el personaje de la abuelina. Ese ha sido un, un ese ha sido una una identificación donde los identificamos nosotros los hispanos con el mensaje que ella los brinda, donde los dan consejos de preferencia prevención y, a, y acción. Es un recurso muy sabio que la iniciativa latina ha puesto en práctica y que sigue funcionando hasta el día de hoy. Nos gustaría que sigan extendiendo los fondos para apoyar al Departamento de Comunicaciones de la Iniciativa Latina de la Salud. Hemos, hemos tenido grandes resultados en el material que ellos elaboran. Llegan a personas que inclusive no saben leer ni escribir por la manera, en la manera clara que ellos exponen las imágenes, imágenes flyers y videos. Han logrado que se pueda entender más fácil. Queremos seguir contando con el apoyo de ellos, logrando que se pueda entender más fácil, logrando entender para continuar sirviendo nuestra comunidad con, de una manera completa. Espero que mi solicitud sea considerada dentro del presupuesto. Gracias. Good evening. My name is uh, Reina Isabel Ochoa, and I appreciate the opportunity that you have given me to be here tonight. I am here to request that the county executive support the communications department of the Latino Health Initiative within this budget for the next fiscal year 2025. The reason for my request is that as a health promoter, I have realized that the responsibility of developing materials that they have provided connects our Latino community with language, culture, and services based on their needs. A very clear example is Abuelina, with which we identify. She always gives us a message of prevention and action. It is a very wise uh, resource that the initiative has put into practice and that is still working to this day. We would like them to continue extending funds to support the communications department of the Latino Health Initiative. We have great results. The materials they develop reach people who may not even know how to read or write. But the, but the clear way they use the images, the flyers, and the videos have made it so much easier for them to understand. We want to continue to count on supporting them to serve our community in a more complete way. I hope that my request is considered within your budget this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Mark Disler. Uh, Mark Disler, Rockville. I urge the council to take whatever budgetary steps needed for retention and hiring to make significant progress in restaffing the police. I favor more use of MCOTs, technology, violence interrupters, whatever works, but there is no substitute for adequate numbers of police on the street. According to a recent post-UMD poll, 68% of Montgomery County voters believe increased patrols would help. Instead, we have a serious staffing crisis across the department likely to worsen next year. Council staff and the chief have repeatedly warned us about rising violent crime and decreasing officers. Response time is up. The county police have had to reduce its role in parts of the county. The county's responses have been insufficient and we are less safe because of it. Does the proposed budget do all it can to reverse these dangerous trends? A few suggestions. One, do we actively recruit lateral transfers and from beyond the DMV, like in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast? We should offer lateral bonuses and reasonable relocation assistance. Second, contract with an outside, non-ideological, professional organization for an independent analysis of why officers are leaving early, what is the state of morale and why, and to offer recommendations on retention, hiring, and efficiency. The Police Executive Research Forum might be one option. Non-ideological is key. 
we do not need people telling us to cut sworn officer FTEs by 50% in one third of our police districts like the reimagining task force recommended. Third, please heed Chief Jones's March 18 testimony, quote, I highly emphasize that morale be supported, unquote. That should include wellness programs and work-life balance, but also the attitudes and policies of county government in this connection for Please avoid ideological straitjackets that make us less safe. For example, I don't care what MAGA might say. If we are allowed to hire legal permanent residents and to tweak the pot bar to bring on more applicants, let's do it. Conversely, rather than pass bills like 2-24 that reflect deep mistrust of the police and strip them of a lawful tool, direct the chief to focus on improved consensual searches as necessary. Lastly, Consider requiring a public safety impact statement to consider the impact of residential and other development on public safety resource needs. At some point, we need to get ahead of this curve. As a resident and with a family member victimized by a violent crime here, it is disturbing to see violent crime continue to go up and the number of police continue to go down. Please do better. Thank you. Our last speaker on this panel, Link Hoeing. Good evening, I'm Link Hoeing from the Fair Access Committee for the Western County. I've been testifying so often here, you probably don't need to hear about the committee. I just hope I haven't overstayed my welcome. I'm here today to urge your support for a $230,000 line item in the HHS budget to fund WOMCO's work to offer healthcare services including dental and primary care to Western County residents who either can't afford these services or can't easily get to them because they are often 10 or more miles away from these services. As you know, hidden need, distance, isolation, and lack of population are some of the challenges we face in our area. We founded Fair Access, as you all know, around the belief that the county is fundamentally grounded in a commitment to equity. Our job is to show the inequities and that exist and then push to redress them. The lack of routine and convenient health care and dental services for so many is one of the major inequities we face. While we need county support to help improve the lives of our residents in the Western County, our community does all it can to help find solutions and identify data that will help address the problems. We try to develop solutions on our own and proven approaches that can meet the unique needs of our residents. Several years ago, WOMCO set out to prove the unmet need for health care that's real in our area by procuring a grant from the Healthcare Initiative Foundation to begin operating clinics. It also hired a health care coordinator. I know t she testified already. He, she reached out to health care providers such as Care for Your Health to offer a wide variety of medical services to our needy residents. The WOMCO even worked to get mobile dental services for residents, and I visited these dental services, and it's amazing how many people don't have dental care in our area. When the county rebuffed us and said they did not have evidence of the need, we got to work to show it exists. WOMCO has also demonstrated how it can adapt and expand its portfolio to offer services it knows its clients need that can't get from the county. Our area has only one charitable services organization, and that is WOMCO. They can offer a health care services program. They've shown they can do it. It has broad community support and has a deep knowledge of both the needs of its clients and the area of the, they serve. The most practical and effective way to address these serious and unmet health care needs is to approve this grant to WOMCO and also make it a standing line item in future budgets. By funding this grant to WOMCO, you will be taking an important step in addressing a major health inequity, helping the needy in our area get access to needed health care services that are today unavailable or too expensive for many of them or just plain too far away. Thank you, and I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. That is it for this panel. Our next panel, Linda Flores, Jennifer Martin, Amira Hassan, Maria Lucila Cordero Rodriguez, Michael Larkin, Dr. Christine Handy, and Pia Morrison.
Linda Flores, when you're ready. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Linda Flores, soy promotora de salud y esta noche quiero pedirles que por favor nos incluya en el presupuesto del año fiscal 2025 para el trabajo que hacemos los promotores de salud y el Departamento de Comunicaciones de la Iniciativa Latina de Salud, ya que nosotros somos esa conexión entre la comunidad y los diferentes recursos que existen en el condado de Montgomery. El Departamento de Comunicaciones nos prepara los materiales que contiene la información que nosotros compartimos con la comunidad, como lo son guía de recursos, flyer, videos cortos, noticias. Todo esto nosotros lo compartimos en WhatsApp, en Facebook y en otras redes sociales. Lamentablemente hay mucha necesidad en nuestra comunidad y la gente ya nos reconoce como las personas que podemos informarles sobre esos servicios. Una señora se me acercó a mí manifestando que tenía síntomas en sus senos. La referí para que le hicieran una mamografía y gracias a Dios pudo hacer sus exámenes sin costo y recibir un tratamiento temprano contra el cáncer. Muchas gracias por siempre porque siempre nos han apoyado para poder servir a nuestra comunidad y por favor síganos apoyando en el próximo año que viene. Gracias. Hello, good evening. My name is Linda Flores and I am a health promoter. Tonight I would like to request to please include funds for the work that the health promoters do and for the communications department of the Latino Health Initiative in the 2025 budget. As together we are the connection between the community and the resources available in Montgomery County. The communications team prepares materials uh, that contains information we share with the community, such as resource guides, uh, news, and short videos that are shared through WhatsApp, Facebook, and other social media platforms. Unfortunately, there is a lot of need in our community, and people already recognize us as the people who can inform them about the services. A woman once approached me expressing that she had symptoms in her breasts. I refer her to getting mammogram, and thank God she was able to receive her exams uh, without cost and receive early treatment for cancer. Thank you very much for always supporting us to serve our community, and please continue to support us next year. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Jennifer Martin. Good evening, President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and council members. I speak tonight for the 14,000 educators of the Montgomery County Education Association. MCA members are not just MCPS employees, we're also parents and county residents. So we care deeply about the quality of our schools. We're hopeful that the recent change in MCPS leadership will lead to more honesty and accountability. However, many other problems persist. As a result, our students are struggling, our staff are at the breaking point, and our communities are feeling the repercussions. The Board of Education proposed a budget that would barely cover negotiated contracts and inflationary costs, but the county executive's proposed budget falls more than $50 million short of the board's request. How will we be able to meet the, these costs and uphold contracts without increasing class sizes or reducing services to students? You must ensure the safety and vitality of our educational system by restoring the cuts that the county executive has made. Ongoing and pervasive staff shortages have led to higher class sizes, unmanageable caseloads, and in some cases, perilous conditions for both students and educators. At one special school this year, there has already been a 130% increase in significant behavior incidents, resulting in a 63% increase in workers' compensation claims so far this year. And that's not all. Weapons and other threats to safety have become hazards at many schools this year. Would you want to work in that type of environment? And what about your child? In addition, the understaffing we face for special education students and emergent multilingual learners means we fail to meet legal requirements. To deny adequate funding now means paying out money in lawsuits later. In recent years, the majority of the county's student body has become students of color, 
Meanwhile, the percentage of students needing special education services, English language services, and assistance due to poverty or trauma grows each year. During this time of change, in real dollars, the county's per pupil investment has continued to remain below 2009 levels. We need you to back up your words of support for public school students with renewed investment. Educators are tired of being unfairly blamed for persistent problems in academic gains when we're consistently overworked and under-resourced. We're devoted to our students and give our all to support their progress. As your constituents and as dedicated professionals, we implore you to reflect on the broader impact of underfunding our educational system. The consequences of starving our schools are not isolated. They reverberate throughout our entire community. Stand with us in committing to the future of our students and this county by fully funding the Board of Ed's requested MCPS budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Amira Hassan. Good evening, my name is Amira Hassan and I'm a campaign organizer at Young People for Progress. YPP is an organization dedicated to building political power for young people under 35. I'm also an alumni of Montgomery Blair High School, Argyle Middle School, and Burrs Mill Elementary. I urge the County Council to add funding to the proposed MCPS budget in order to maintain FY24 funding for restorative justice coach stipends and three additional restorative justice specialists, not cut them. MCPS has a problem with unfair school discipline, particularly for students of color. For example, my sister is a sophomore at Kennedy High School. She came to class early and went to the bathroom but returned after the bell rang. When she returned, the teacher refused to let her and other latecomers into the class unless they called their parents. My sister was punished despite the fact that she was not tardy. And even if she was, was the lost instructional time worth it? Or the time that it would take to catch her up to the lesson? Rather than listen to her side of the story, she was already declared guilty. And if she knew about restorative justice or RJ, an RJ coach could have de-escalated the tension between the teacher, our mom, and my sister, which was never resolved. She lost class time and felt disrespected. This is just one example of many. Restorative justice is a philosophy and culture shift towards a more pro positive and inclusive school culture. When used as an alternative to traditional exclusionary forms of discipline, it can yield extraordinary outcomes. It works because trained RJ professionals can teach students the reasons why their actions were harmful, so they're less likely to do it again. This approach is why 81% of RJ service calls in the last school year did not repeat the violation. Focus RJ schools have also benefited for, from a 41% decrease in black student suspensions. These impacts are a great start for a program that's only been implemented in the last couple of years. And over the last couple of days, you've heard from students and other community members who support RJ. It's also a top principal request. Yet we're now considering a proposal to cut stipend funding for restorative justice coaches and some full-time RJ specialist positions. These cuts come at a time when most schools are in the early or reactive stages of RJ implementation. We understand that this is a challenging year, but we implore the council to invest in the work that the county has already started, not divest from it. RJ is an evidence-based solution that works. We all need help navigating complicated emotions and conflicts, especially students after a generation-defining pandemic. Students need to be guided towards progress, not punishment. That's why we urge you to add funding to the proposed MCPS budget so that we can keep FY24 funding for restorative justice coach stipends and specialists. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Maria Lucila Cordero Rodriguez. Muy buenas noches, soy Lucila Cordero, mujer nicaragüense, latina, trabajadora, amante de la superación personal, apasionada por servir. Un día migré con mi idioma español, el miedo, la vida y la esperanza de sobrevivir. Traigo este contexto para explicar el impacto positivo que a mi parecer tiene la confianza del pueblo depositando en los gobernantes del condado para que estos puedan administrar e inviertan sus impuestos en programas como el de la Iniciativa Latina de Salud, LHI. En esta ocasión me referiré a la profesionalización de los promotores de la salud avalados por el Departamento de Salud y Servicios Humanos en español y de manera gratuita. 
El sistema privado, público y civil requiere de personas con nuestra pasión de servicio, habilidad para conectar los servicios y las ayudas a mi comunidad latina que viene aumentando desde el 2010 en un 31.4%, convirtiéndonos en un 20.5% de los habitantes. Reducir los servicios de especialización y emergencia, mejorar la salud y bienestar a través de la prevención y atención temprana, acompañar a disminuir, cambiar o adquirir hábitos saludables de desarrollo y bienestar, disminuir los costos de las organizaciones y programas del gobierno, aportar ideas y relatar las necesidades para mejorar el sistema de salud, educación o cualquier otra área que impacte en la vida de los ciudadanos ciudadanos vulnerables, en riesgo, agrupados en categorías de niños, jóvenes, adultos, adultos mayores, mujeres, hombres, de la comunidad LGTB+, de este condado o de cualquier otro donde nos encontremos. Hoy, gracias a la abogacía de generaciones anteriores, me he beneficiado con la certificación y estoy regresando a este condado lo invertido en mí, llevando información, ofreciendo mis servicios diariamente en la lucha contra el hambre, el desempleo, la violencia. Pero no puedo sola. No puedo con mis 21 compañeros recién graduados, con mis compañeros de la primera generación. La ayuda es mucha, pero la necesidad es mayor. Solo pido esta noche que sumemos esfuerzos, que sigan incluyéndonos en sus decisiones y beneficios brindados. Gracias por escucharme. Good evening. My name is Lucila Cordero. I am a Latina from Nicaragua. I'm a hard worker, lover of personal enrichment, and passionate about serving others. I migrated to this country with my Spanish, with my fears, with my life, uh, hoping I would survive. I mentioned this. Um, to talk about the positive impact of that taxes have on programs as such as such as the Latino Health Initiative. Among the programs that the Latino Health Initiative offers, I uh, offers I am I especially refer to the professionals that work as health promoters. This Spanish free health program is endorsed by the Department of Health and Human Services. The private, public, and civil Public and civil systems require people with a passion for service and the ability to connect services in a my Latino community. Our Latino community has increased since 2010 by 31.4%. Our goal is to guide uh, others, help them uh, acquire healthy habits, uh, help them to develop a healthy well-being, reduce the cost of government organizations and programs, contribute ideas and stories about the needs to improve the health system and ed education and anything that impacts their lives of, vulnerable, of citizens at, at risk, which include our children, young adults, senior citizens, uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community, among others. Today, I, thanks to the advocacy of previous generations, I have received the certification and I am giving back to this county. Uh, the money that was invested, the money invested by me receiving this certification is helping me offer my services to fight hunger, unemployment, and violence. Me and the 21 recent graduates cannot continue the, the work alone. The help that we receive is great, but we need more. This evening, I request that we join forces so that we continue being included in the decisions and benefits provided by the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, great, I was just gonna say, I'll come. okay, perfect. Michael Larkin, who has found his seat. I miscounted by one Marcella translator. I should have counted eight instead of seven. Michael, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you, members of the County Council, for your time tonight. Always appreciated. Uh, my name is Mike Larkin. I live in Silver Spring. In the interest of being fully transparent, I'm on the steering committee for Montgomery for All, but I'm only speaking for myself tonight. I know during the budget season we hear a lot about challenges, but I want to try to reframe the conversation to more about opportunities that we have, opportunities to prioritize what we value, a welcoming, more sustainable, ever more humane county, and what are some things that we can do to bring that to reality? 
We know the county is in a housing crisis, and we need to produ produce affordable units for low and moderate income families as fast as possible. It's great that this budget includes $164 million of money to produce and ex to, to produce and preserve affordable housing, and I would urge this council to try to do even more. We know that we need these units as fast as possible. Last night I was at a Silver Spring Citizens Advisory Board meeting and I heard something absolutely amazing. Not, it wasn't surprising, but still struck me. Um, I heard that there are ride-on bus operators that commute as far as Hagerstown because it's too expensive to live in the county. As someone who sat through ride-on reimagine focus groups, a lot of the things that were discussed during those focus groups are going to mean nothing, such as more bus frequency if we don't have enough bus operators. So that should tell us right then and there we need more housing at all levels of income. What are some other things that we can do to bring a more welcoming and sustainable, more welcoming and humane county? I volunteer at Shepherd's Table, not as much as I would like, and what I do pales in comparison to what the staff is doing there every day, which is why I must strongly urge this council to support the three peer support positions and to bring more mental health professionals to Shepherd's Table. To my knowledge, I believe a psychiatrist only comes twice a month. For anyone who's in there, um, at breakfast time, dinner time, you know a lot more is needed. The staff is working very hard, not only with the clients, but also with volunteers like me who sometimes can't even find the spatula. So they need as much help as possible. I, I know that sounds funny, but I am being very serious. Another thing that our county can do is fully fund the strategic plan to end childhood hunger. One of the saddest things that I think has happened the past couple of years in the United States in general is that we really put a dent in childhood poverty, but we saw that safety net little by little by little become unstuck. Here in Montgomery County, we have a great opportunity to here at the local level to put a dent in hunger and poverty amongst children. It's a great idea. We should do it. It's a moonshot fully funded and I also would urge this council to please put the resources we need in general into the Office of Food System Resilience because not only the kids but the parents are going to be fed. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Dr. Christine Handy. My name is Christine Handy and I am the president of MACAP, the union for administrators within our school district. I come before you today to advocate passionately for the total funding of Montgomery County Public Schools budget. This past year, our community has faced unprecedented challenges, testing our resilience. In the face of these adversities, our leaders, teachers, and support professionals have shown unwavering dedication, ensuring that our students did not miss a beat in their education. Their commitment and hard work deserves our most utmost appreciation. I acknowledge the County Council's concerns regarding transparency and accountability within our district. However, withholding essential funding would only exacerbate the challenges we are already confronting. Our children's education should not be compromised by external circumstances beyond their control. Additionally, it is crucial to honor our commitments to our dedicated employees. This includes fulfilling negotiated agreements regarding compensation and benefits. Our employees matter, and we must ensure that they are adequately supported to continue delivering excellence in education. Moreover, maintaining reasonable class sizes and recruiting and retaining quality educators are pivotal, pivotal, pivotal <laughs> in reclaiming MCPS's status as a premier school district. We do not want our ability to financially support dual enrollment or pay for students to take the SAT and AP exams to be jeopardized. We need to continue funding restorative justice coaches, social workers, and an adequate number of school psychologists. Underfunding exacerbates existing shortages, particularly in special education and substitute teachers, and complicates recruiting and retaining specialized staff. As a 20-year veteran principal, I recognize firsthand the tough decisions that you must make. 
amidst these difficult choices, you must do one thing, and that is prioritize the well-being and future of the children in Montgomery County Public Schools. Our children matter. Our collective responsibility is to ensure they receive the resources and support they deserve. We must recognize that the quality of our schools directly impacts our community's future prosperity. Investing in our schools is not just about education. It's an investment in Montgomery County's future. Great schools attract families and encourage economic growth by attracting businesses seeking a skilled workforce. Your decision on school funding is a decision for our community's future. As elected leaders, your role in supporting our school district is crucial. I implore you to fulfill your duties by properly funding our schools. Let us work together to ensure that MCPS receives the support they need to thrive and continue providing exceptional education to all students. Your support is integral to our success. Thank you so much for your attention to this critical matter and your commitment to the well-being of our community. Thank you. Our next speaker, Pia Morrison. President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and honorable members of Montgomery County Council. I'm Pia Morrison, president of SCIU Local 500, one of the largest public sector unions in Maryland with over 20,000 members strong. I come before you today as an ally and friend of this community. I call on you to address the shortcomings proposed in the county executive's budget in regards to Montgomery County Public Schools. This budget is inadequate to support our students, staff, and community. Underfunding our school system makes little sense when exacerbated staffing shortages are already stretching folks thin. Staff are facing increased workloads, burnout, and decreased morale due to inadequate support, which ultimately, as we all know, compromises the quality of education received by our most vulnerable students. We see this in staff caseloads for behavioral and mental health services that are staggeringly higher than national recommendations. We also see how underfunding worsens existing inequities and thus undermines efforts to promote social and economic mobility. These budget shortfalls will result in a loss of educators to surrounding counties and to other career sectors. Public education is and always will be one of the great equalizers in the fight for social and economic justice. The quality of our public education is a direct factor in future economic development for Montgomery County businesses. I call on the elected officials of Montgomery County to fully honor the negotiated contracts, including pay and benefits for all educators and staff in our school system. Please fully fund the MCPS budget like the future depends on it, because it does. Thank you. Our next panel, Floor Yanes, Stephanie Joseph, Emmanuel Jean Phillip. Jean Philippe, excuse me, Deborah Kimmel, Norma Columbus, and Mandy Dalton. Florianis, Stephanie Joseph, Emmanuel Jean Philippe, Deborah Kimmel, Norma Columbus, Mandy Dalton. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Florianis? Flora's not here. Okay, no problem. Stephanie Joseph? Good evening, President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and members of the County Council. My name is Stephanie Joseph, and I live in Germantown. The Access to Behavioral Health Services recommended expenditure as a percentage of the FY25 Behavioral Health and Crisis Services budget is slightly less as compared to the FY24 budget. I'm asking the County Council to support more mental health funding. As you know, Montgomery County's Department of HHS 2023 Community Health Needs Assessment 
identified mental health and specifically access to behavioral health services as the most critical issue facing our county. Survey community members reported a lack of mental health providers in the county, as well as challenges navigating the health care system. I am one of the 20% of U.S. adults living with a mental illness, and I know firsthand how challenging it is to access needed mental health care within a large health care system. In 2021, after I self-referred to my out-of-network psychologist for medically necessary mental health care treatment, my insurance carrier denied coverage, and the only explanation they gave was that I had to see a network provider. I would have had to pay $200 an hour for therapy, which I could not afford. My therapist had recommended trauma treatment for PTSD. She has specialized training and expertise in PTSD, which made her ideally qualified to meet my needs. This care is not available within my insurance network. My carrier does not allow bi-weekly session frequency like my therapist. Their model does not permit predictable standing weekly appointments. It is not unheard of to wait four weeks between appointments due to a lack of providers. Not every therapist is a good fit for every client. Therapists are not interchangeable like brands of peanut butter. It is critical I work with a professional who meets consistently and has experience treating patients like me. My insurance company did not consider my individual needs and what was best for my care when they denied my request. I would have received an inappropriate and lower level of care than indicated. Had I seen a network provider given their constraints, my mental health would have declined, leaving me at elevated risk of suffering and potential death by suicide. I had to sue to get the services I sought and deserved. I appeared before an administrative law judge without representation and was awarded a favorable decision. My therapist has a third party agreement with my carrier and I have continued to see her to this day. I am fortunate to be in recovery. Everyone is worthy of getting proper treatment. I hope you can support more funding for mental health services so people in this county will not have to fight for essential care like I did. Thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel Jean Philippe. Good evening, dear honorable members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Emmanuel Jean Philippe, and I have the privilege of serving as the principal of Arcola Elementary School in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. Additionally, I am honored to act as one of two co-chairs for Title I Principals, the Title I Principal Professional Learning Community. Today, I address you with uh, a humble request to commit to fully funding the Montgomery County Public Schools budget. My connection to Montgomery County runs deep. Both my wife and I are proud employees of MCPS. Uh, we do not only work here, but we live, worship, and raise our family in this vibrant community. The excellence of MCPS school system, uh, the, the excellence of the MCPS school system has been a driving force behind our decision to remain in Montgomery County. MCPS provides uh, and continues to aspire to provide an educational environment that nurtures both academic and social growth and preparing students for success in college careers and beyond. As a parent, I am proud to say that two of my children have graduated from Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, one is pursuing a career in nursing, um, another is currently in Montgomery College, and uh, our youngest is going to be starting high school. Um, okay, I'm going to hold it together. <laughs> okay. So please fund, please fund, please fund. Today I serve as an advocate for over 160,000 students who represent diverse backgrounds, speaking over 162 languages across 211 schools. Our dedicated workforce of over 24,000 employees is committed to ensuring that every child in Montgomery County receives a high quality education. As we consider the FY25 operating budget, it is crucial that our focus remains on ensuring schools have the resources that are needed to promote the success of all children. 
It is imperative that MCPS be able to remain steadfast in its efforts to recruit and retain high quality staff members. Our children deserve educators who are not only skilled in their respective fields, but also have, are also deeply committed to their well-being. The work of MCPS staff extends far beyond academics. They serve as trusted adults who provide comfort and support to our students during moments of joy and adversity alike. By fully funding MCPS, you are investing in the hope and future of every student in Montgomery County. I encourage you to provide the funding to MCPS. Thank you. Our next speaker, Deborah Kimmel. Good evening. My name is Deborah Kimmel, and I'm asking you to save money by supporting a low cost, high volume spay neuter clinic in Montgomery County's Office of Animal Services. This year, Montgomery County's animal shelter will take in about 4,000 dogs and cats with a $4 million operating budget for the shelter alone. That's about $1,000 average to shelter an unwanted animal. You know how much it costs to spay, neuter a cat or dog? About 100 bucks. 100 bucks to prevent litters of cats and dogs that end up at the shelter costing taxpayers an average $1,000 each. We have a proposal that leverages a free, surgically equipped mobile clinic, which was visited by Council Member Mink recently. Our clinic will reach out to residents who live with challenges, challenges that inhibit pet ownership and public animal welfare, challenges that are financial, mobility, transportation, language, literacy, or the struggles of raising a family on a tight budget. Current small-scale spay-neuter programs lack capacity or are too expensive to provide this service efficiently across our county. Council members received a report on a shelter audit that was completed just a couple of months ago. Shelter intakes across the United States are decreasing, but in Montgomery County, shelter intakes are increasing. The report found that Montgomery County should be spay-neutering about 5,000 cats and dogs a year to decrease shelter intake. This is far more than the 400 surgeries currently covered by a small grant. Operating full-time, our clinic can spay and neuter about 3,000 dogs and cats per year. Our proposal was developed in collaboration with the Office of Animal Services, it was approved by the outgoing director, Tom Koenig. It was part of last year's budget and approved, but eliminated on the recommendation of a legislative analyst. We look forward to again approving this initiative and working with the incoming director of the Office of Animal Services, Caroline Harefield. I am respectfully asking you to advocate forcefully, please, for funding low-cost spay and neuter as part of the Office of Animal Services budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Norma Columbus. Good evening to the council member. My name is Norma Columbus, community health worker. In our community outreach, we noticed that we need more community clinic, dental clinic, and vision clinic. That's why we are here, remind, keeping in your budget for the fiscal year 2025. Then we can do a better job and have a healthy Montgomery. Thank you for the advance. Thank you. Our next and final speaker on this panel, Mandy Dalton. Well, thank you, council members, for allowing me to speak to you tonight, uh, Council uh, President Friedson. Uh, by the way, I just want to start by thanking you guys and thanking your staffs because you are addressing one of the worst crises we've ever had in this county, and that's the affordable housing crisis. You guys are working crazy hard. 
and I really want to know you. I, I really want you to know. I want to know too. I really want you to know how much we really appreciate this effort. So please, you know. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Mandy Dalton, and I'm testifying tonight to support funding to preserve and expand affordable housing in the county, especially the rental assistance program. Without expanding the supply and more direct rental assistance, many hardworking people will have nowhere to live. And you're aware of that, I know. I've lived at uh, Milestone Apartments in Germantown uh, since 2020. I feel safe in that quiet community. It's really, really a great place to live, but I couldn't afford to live there without my HUD Section 8 housing voucher. Before obtaining the voucher in 2016, I couldn't afford to rent anywhere even though I was working Four highly technical jobs. Four. Uh, I, I lost my place a little bit, but here we go. I couldn't. I could only afford to rent rooms in other people's houses on four jobs. So when I received my voucher, my apartment provided me privacy and dignity. Now, working so hard, however, uh, took its toll physically and mentally, and now I have disability. I receive just a little over $1,000 a month. A month. That's not even a rent here in Montgomery County. Uh, and even with my uh, disability and my voucher, inflation has forced me to rely on a part-time job for all the other things that subsidies will not cover. I have no family to take care of me, and I would be homeless without that voucher. I urge you to fund programs that expand affordable housing and keep and help keep people in their homes, like the county's uh, rental assistance program. It's no secret that the county is experiencing a mental health crisis. I can tell you from my own story, probably yours, Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and kind words. Um, our next panel, Mitchell Tropin, Waleska Flores Rovello, Sanders Thomas, Irma Washington, Aaron Droller, and Dorothea Barnes. Our speaker number 34, Mary Kohler, has switched her spot with Irma Washington for transportation related uh, issues, just for colleagues. Mitchell Tropin, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Am I on? Yes. Good evening, Council Chair, members of the Council. Good to see so many familiar faces. My name is Mitch Tropin. I serve as Vice President of Higher Education for SEIU Local 500. I've also been teaching at Montgomery College for over 20 years. I'm here tonight to strongly urge this Council to fully fund Montgomery College's fiscal 2025 budget request. In preparing my remarks, I thought about a great writer, Roger Kahn, who's probably best known for his books on baseball, uh, the classic The Boys of Summer. Now, Mr. Kahn did more than just write about baseball. He actually bought a team, the Utica New York Blue Sox, which played in a Class D minor league, the lowest level of organized baseball. After, per after completing the purchase, Kahn met with the team general manager who went over the team's roster, which was mostly rookies. As the two men were speaking, Khan stopped the general manager and asked, are these guys any good? General manager leaned forward and said, they're good enough to dream. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the council, 
the students at Montgomery College, every one of them, are good enough to dream. And with your full financial support, those dreams will be realized. And they're not the only ones. The faculty, support staff, and administration are also pursuing their dreams for creating a better educational institution that serves the needs and dreams of all county residents, young and all. Now we know that dreams are not confined to any part of our county. So that's why we're opening an education center at East County that hopefully will blossom into a fourth campus. And dreams are not confined to any nationality. I am the faculty advisor for the Germantown student newspaper. My current editor-in-chief is from Peru. Her predecessor was from El Salvador. And her predecessor was from Cameroon. This is typical of MC, where students come from all parts of the world to pursue their own dreams. Our diversity should be a source of pride for everyone who lives in the county. Our administration also knows that pursuing a dream may require some extra help. MC has responded with adding coaches and tutors to many of our courses so a student who is struggling is not left behind. And that extra help also includes greater awareness of the mental health needs of our students. Moreover, we know our students with dreams include students of color. Dr. Williams is making sure they have no obstacles because of the color of their skin. For the past year, all faculty have been engaged in the journey toward creating an anti-racist institution. Now, Roger Kahn owned a major league team, but there's nothing Bush League about MC. With full financial support, everyone at MC will give everything they need to give our students the tools, skills, and confidence and opportunities so their dreams can come true, even if it takes extra innings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Valeska Flores Ravelo. Honorables miembros de la comunidad de Montgomery y el Consejo. Agradezco a cada uno de ustedes por la oportunidad que me permiten a través de esta plataforma dirigirme a ustedes para solicitar fondos para esta iniciativa que tenemos los inmigrantes latinos. Hoy me quiero dirigir respetuosamente en nombre de muchas familias inmigrantes que tienen hijos con discapacidad y se encuentran en el proceso de inmigración e integración social en este país. Como una orgullosa miembro del condado de Montgomery, el día de hoy también solicito fondos a todas esas propuestas y organizaciones que se identifican trabajando uno a uno con los inmigrantes, que en este caso específicamente también son padres de niños con discapacidades, padres que quieren ser integrados a la sociedad como miembros activos y proactivos, que no sean parte de la estadística, sino que de la solución también. Estos padres tienen consideraciones también para quienes no pueden ser integrados o no pueden ser agregados en programas como búsquedas de empleo, capacitaciones en centros especializados, ayuda también en el soporte del cuidado de sus hijos. Y en el momento en que cada una de estas familias recibe un diagnóstico, con el diagnóstico, con el diagnóstico también va acompañado un tratamiento. En dicho tratamiento, el aislamiento, la incertidumbre y el temor para buscar nuevas oportunidades acompañan a estas familias. Es aquí donde yo solicito muy respetuosamente a las comunidades y autoridades pertinentes que tienen un papel fundamental en estas familias a desarrollar e integrar junto con los otros miembros de la comunidad programas que los apoyen a capacitarse y a integrarse cada vez más como madre de un niño con discapacidad que orgullosamente asiste a las escuelas del, Mon del condado de Montgomery y recibe un IEP program, quisiera integrarme y quisiera también solicitar a ustedes y agradecer al mismo tiempo todas las ayudas que han dado hasta el día de hoy. Ayuda con el cuidado de nuestros hijos, ayuda a que nuestros hijos se integren más en el sistema educativo, ya que hace cinco años estoy participando activamente como Community Health Worker en este condado y en el condado de Frederick, y me he dado cuenta de la necesidad y de la cantidad de fondos que necesitan para continuar con este tipo de programas. Muchísimas gracias y espero que mi historia haya ayudado mucho para que puedan considerar la ayuda de estos fondos. Gracias. Honorable members of the Montgomery County community, I appreciate each one of you for the valuable time that you allow me through this space to share my testimony with you. Today I respectfully address to you that request to help, uh, to help 
executing the support programs for immigrant parents who have children with disabilities and are in the process of social integration to this country. As a proud resident of Montgomery County, I ask for your assistance today with funds and in initiatives that support nonprofit organizations that currently aid immigrant families. Especially, I request help in opening a new training center that provides support to parents with children with disabilities with social Social integration programs in the county who wish to, proact to be proactive members of their community but find themselves in vulnerable situations in the first months as after migrating to this country. The moment a family receives a diagnosis for their children, which is something that they never expected in the first place, is significantly, significantly life-changing. Isolation, uncertainty, and fear flirt the lives of every family member. On top of that, you have to add the radical change of looking for new opportunities, the need of looking for new opportunities where resources in your languages are limited. Not knowing where to find help or having to find a job near your home so that you can have enough time to dedicate to your child with special needs who requires extraordinary support from their families so they are able to develop their abilities and live a dignified and fulfilling life as all children deserve. This is something uh, non-negotiable. This is where the community and decision makers play an important and fundamental role in helping these families achieve development and integration into that community. Today, I request with a heavy heart as a proud mother of an MCPS student with disability and on behalf of all the parents and families in Montgomery County with children with disabilities who wish to integrate into society with assistance and care for their children while they work or study. Programs to support mental health and trainings that provide the necessary information that these parents need. For the past five years, I have been actively involved in my community as a community health promoter, helping low-income families with children with disabilities to identify their needs and connect connect them with community resources. Being able to share my experience with other parents or validate how they truly feel also makes me feel very good. And it also reminds me that there are more people out there going through the same thing. Montgomery County could greatly improve the lives of many families by opening training centers, support, and resources for immigrant families with children with disabilities to help them to quickly integrate into the educational, health, employment, and professional training systems so that that each of these families feel valued, counted, and can achieve appropriate integration to this country that has opened the doors to them. I hope that my story helps other families and that we're able to work collectively to integrate these ideas and achieve a more social, emotional, and workforce support. I appreciate the opportunity and honors to, and honor to speak this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Sanders Thomas. Sanders Thomas here. It's on, it's on. It's on. Just leave it. Yep. Just go ahead and speak when you're ready. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Sandy Thomas. I'm honored to be before you all. I um. I am presently a resident of affordable housing. I am here to urge the council to provide more funding for affordable housing, including for individuals who are experiencing homelessness and or disabilities. I have been a resident of Montgomery County for many years, approximately 15. I am currently living in the White Flint Station Apartments in North Bethesda. I found affordable housing through Housing Unlimited. I became homeless at the very beginning of the pandemic. I became, my life was turned upside down, and I do mean upside down. I found myself hospitalized. While in the hospital, there was an individual who thought 
that Housing Unlimited could could help me to get me out of my car and off the street, which is where I was living, being homeless. It worked. I was approved. Housing Unlimited helped me to get off the street, placed me in an accessible unit to accommodate my disabilities. I was also helped by Cornerstone of Montgomery, which gave me the ability to live independently. I currently reside with a roommate, but my goal is to one day have my own house, apartment, independently and that will be home. Affordable housing has drastically improved the quality of my life. I'm not worrying today. I'm hopeful. This, this is thanks to the county's past support. Thank you all. I'm re reaping the benefits now. I hope that you all will continue to support affordable housing and meet the needs of Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Irma Washington. Good evening, Council, and everyone here. It's nice to see you and everyone else. Good evening. Um, my name is Irma Washington. I'm here to tell you how affordable housing has made a great impact in my life. 20 years ago, I was a mother of three adopted children, ranging from ages six to seven. They had been in foster care most of their life and had many emotional and behavioral challenges. At the time, I was living in an apartment that could not accommodate the living space needed that would require for, them, for their healing and, and care. I was blessed to have been able to get on the waiting list of the housing voucher program in Montgomery County HOC. I, I was employed with um, Montgomery County Public Schools as a paraeducator at the time. Three years later, I received a call from HOC that, was a, that I was approved and had a chance to um, improve the living conditions of my children and also myself. Having affordable housing was the true blessing. I was able to raise my children in Sandy Spring community in the Sandy Spring community. They had space to feel free and at home. They had the opportunity to attend the schools in walking distance from their homes and feel complete secure. My children are grown are doing my children are doing well. They still have some challenges, but they are well. After my children grew up to become parents of their own, I found myself on disability and no longer able to perform the job that I was trained to do. I had to retire from MCPS as a paraeducator. My income had changed greatly. I, con con I contacted uh, Montgomery County HLC for assistance and they were able to help me in securing housing through one of their pro supportive programs. I now live at the town center um, community in Olney. I have a physical disability, so I was downsized in one of the units that accommodated my disability. It's like a, um, uh, I lost mobility, so the unit I'm living in is um, very, everything's on one floor, so um, sometimes, sometimes life brings unexpected challenges as shown by my story. But when you have stability, stability, when you have affordable housing, you are able to navigate those challenges. I am here tonight because I wanted to put a face on those, on those you are helping when you are funding, when you're, when you fund affordable housing. Please continue to support the, the county's affordable housing and program in the budget. Thank you. 
Thank you. This year and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is Aaron Droller here? I don't see Aaron Droller. Dorothea Barnes. Good evening, all council members and everyone who has attended this meeting. My name is Dorothea Barnes, and I don't know what I would be without affordable housing. I came to live in Montgomery County nearly 30 years ago with my two children. I benefited from affordable housing. During those years, I lost my job, and unfortunately, I had to reside in the shelter for a number of years, longer than I anticipated. Fortunately, I no longer live in a shelter, but I still benefit from affordable housing at this time. I don't think enough can be said about the need for affordable housing to continue to be funded in Montgomery County. Um, when I um, became I would say homeless and in the shelter, it left me in the press state of mind. And just like Miss Thompson, Miss Sandy Thompson, I too am uh, benefit from Housing Unlimited. Um, I've been there for over nearly five years and it is my goal to live in independently again. Um, my income is, I'm receiving Social Security, um, which only required to pay a percentage of my rent. If it wasn't for affordable housing, I would not be able to afford anything, not even a room. So it is my request of the council is to continue to provide affordable housing for all those who need it within this county, not only in 2025, but beyond. Um, and like I said, I have benefited from affordable housing. Montgomery County has been good, and I hope it continues in this path. Thank you for listening and hearing me. Thank you for sharing. Our next uh, panel, Jan Brown, Helen Teckel, Mary Kohler, Arthur Dell, <laughs> Vernell Knight, and Peter Daigle. <laughs> Jan Brown, Helen Teckel, Mary Kohler, Arthur Dell, Vernell Knight, and Peter Daigle.
Jim Brown, when you're ready. Feel free to begin when you're ready. Good evening, council members. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. In fact, I'm proud to be here. Uh, my name is Jan Brown, and I'm here before you as a living testament to the transformative power of affordable housing. For the past seven years, I've been a proud resident of Montgomery Housing Partnership, Bonifant Senior Partners, Apartments. I live in downtown Silver Spring. It's a community that has significantly enhanced the quality of my life. I actually have my grandson Christopher to thank for helping me find affordable housing. Christopher discovered the Bonifant while it was still under construction. He was impressed by what he had seen and had learned about the Bonifant, and he recognized what a great opportunity it would be for Granny to live there. At that time, my grandson and I were living in a single family home in DC. Had my grandson and daughter not encouraged, well, pushed me, <laughs> to move to the Bonifant, I would have been an old lady sitting in the living room, looking out the window all day, or sitting on the front porch watching the world go by. Living in affordable housing at the Bonifant has given me a new lease on life. I feel rejuvenated. Almost 20 years, or maybe more than that, younger than my 84. <laughs> yeah, I do go. <laughs> the Bonifant not only provides me a safe, and comfortable home, but it also provides a vibrant social network with a wealth of activities. Yet the reality is that there are countless seniors like me who are yearning for such opportunities. The demand for affordable housing far exceeds the supply particularly in esteemed communities like downtown Silver Spring. The housing crisis has only worsened since I moved into the Bonifant um, almost, seven, almost eight years ago now. I think I said five. As a community, I think we need to find a way to provide housing for low-income people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Helen Teckel. Good evening, member of... I'm sorry, I'm so nervous. This is my first time speaking. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Welcome. We're very happy to have you. Take your time. All right. Uh, good evening, member of the council and everyone. My name is Helen Teckel, and affordable housing has been foundation to my life. I'm here tonight to speak the impact that affordable housing has and to ask you to make it the top priority in this year of, in this year's budget. I currently live in Bethesda, an affordable apartment with my children, but this wasn't always the case. Two years ago, my family and I were practically, practically homeless due to domestic situation we were in, where it felt like a mental and physical prison where we were not allowed to think or do anything. Years ago, the police officer were called due to domestic disturbance at our home one of the officer pulled me aside and told me to consider divorce and move out and I shouldn't be treated this way. But I knew that all along because I already tried it a year before with full, full time job and I wasn't be able to afford it. That's why I went back to square one. I told her that I knew she was right. I just couldn't afford the housing cost with my small children. This went on for years. With the little information that I had, I tried to apply with small, I tried to apply government assistance, but the search was hopeless. 
Eventually, my situation became unbearable, and that's when I decided to just move out with no plan in hand. Some days we sleep at a motel, if we can afford it, and other days we went to crisis center. Later on, I visited the HH office in Rockville, seeking assistance, and it was then I was connected with the National Center for Children and Families. I come from a culture that believes it's forbidden to speak out about your household issues, you hide your troubles and struggles in silence. You can imagine what it takes for me to come and speak in public. But once, but once I found a home to any CCF, I could breathe again, I realized what a normal life could be like. My apartment isn't just a home, it's a place where I found myself again, it was, I was in a dark place before I find affordable housing. Now I'm happy and it gave me a second chance to dream again and go back to school to achieve American dream and be a mother that my children are proud of. More importantly, my kids are happy. We live in such great community with a great public school. We feel blessed to call Montgomery County home. Finding affordable housing has provided a foundation for my family and me that allow us to thrive. I'm a living testimony that affordable housing as critical as the air I breathe. I understand you will be faced with many difficult decisions during budget, but funding affordable housing shouldn't be one of them. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, Mary Kohler. Good evening. My name is Mary Kohler, and I'm testifying on behalf of Montgomery Housing Alliance. As you take up the budget, MHA strongly encourages you to include the highest possible level of funding for affordable housing. The proposed budget has record levels of funding for affordable housing programs, and we commend the Council and County Executive for budgeting consistent increases for housing funding over the past several years. To truly and meaningfully address need, however, the County must significantly increase the scope of funding for housing preservation and development. Over the past several years, the Council has prioritized housing, especially affordable housing, and made major strides on the issue. Yet we know we must still add over 30,000 units of housing by 2030, the majority of which must be affordable to low and moderate income households. While the proposed budget includes increased funding for affordable housing production and preservation, funding need for projects far exceeds it. We know there are projects in need of at least 200 million in funding, um, the, the true need is likely even higher. MHA member organizations alone help pipeline projects in need of over $170 million. Further, with higher construction costs, labor costs, insurance, and interest rates, each dollar of funding builds less today than it did a year ago. As projects wait for funding, costs compound, jeopardizing whether they can move forward. In order to meet the county's housing targets, providers need a variety of capital at a higher level than included in the proposed budget. Additionally, we urge you to support the Planning Department's full budget request. Updated master plans and other supportive efforts are important to aligning our land use policies with our housing needs, and it is critical to ensure that planning has adequate funding and staffing. We also ask you to support DEP's request for funding for under-resourced buildings that are required to comply with BEPS and to fully fund the Grain Bank with 10% of revenues from the fuel energy tax. We appreciate the Council's efforts to increase funding for the Green Bank. They will play a critical role in helping under-resourced and affordable housing buildings comply with BEPS. We applaud the Council's ongoing commitment to housing and your efforts to craft innovative policy tools to address the real and significant need that persists. Affordable housing remains one of the County's most pervasive and persistent challenges. The Council is well aware of the on-the-ground on effects of the housing shortage and the impact that affordable housing has. Maximizing resor resources will allow us to produce affordable units at the necessary scale to ensure a diverse, vibrant, and economically robust Montgomery County where all ha residents have, the ho have homes they can afford. Without a transformative level of investment in housing development and preservation, we will fall short of addressing our, our housing needs. We strongly urge you to pass a budget that includes the highest possible levels of funding for the HIF, the Nonprofit Preservation Fund, and other important housing priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Arthur Dow. Arthur, just make sure you hit your button. Yep, you got it. You're I'm good. good? Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening, council members. My name is Arthur Dow. 
I'm a resident of Ford and Houses um, Housing. As somebody who has benefit from the county's investment in affordable housing, I'm asking you to provide even more funding in the coming years. I found affordable housing through the National Center for Children and Families. I was looking for a better and more affordable place to live when someone I knew um, referred me to NCCF. I have been living at my current apartment in Tacoma Park for a little over a year. I work full-time at a daycare program. Before I found housing through NCCF, I was paying about $1,400 a month and living paycheck to paycheck. And now I'm paying half that. When I was paying $1,400, um, some days I would barely have food for me to eat. Um, with this housing, it has helped me tremendously. Um, I can save a little bit more. Um, now I'm able to save a lot more and well, before that it was very difficult uh, trying to budget um, and stuff like that. As you guys know, the prices went up for almost everything, it seems like air and all that. Um, so this housing is very helpful for someone young like me, people growing up, trying to make it on their own. After COVID hit, I was down bad. but. Once I got referred to NCCF, it helped me with better opportunities and individually for me and some family members um, to not struggle through life. I love the neighborhood that I am in. I do give back to the community by also helping um, in the housing stuff, help with, you know, taking the trash out, making sure the neighborhood is clean and neat and looking um, very nice for people to come and see. Um, I do appreciate the funding that the county has provided in the past. We do ask um, to do even more this year for people like myself to find affordable homes. Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Vernell Knight. Well, good afternoon, Council, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to come here. My name is Vernon Knight. I'm a resident of affordable housing. But where I live is at uh, Victory Forest of Senior Citizens. It's a senior home. And the, I had a chance to visit with another one, uh, another building. I'm, the, a res like I said, I'm the resident president. Most of those people there, they suffer the same problem. Uh, you say uh, if they take it seven, if they get Social Security, that's uh, 740 times 12, that's less than $9,000 a year. At the same point in time, I know you all have a difficult job, but I have, there's 180 units there. They get food boxes, but they only get slots for 35. 11, 30, and 12 o'clock at night, sometimes 10. You'll see people coming down there scrounging for food that's left by others. I've had to talk to some scenes that I've loaned money to because they choose between medicine and food or they cut the medicine in half so they can still buy food. Affordable housing is great, but with the, with the economic increase in food and the other necessities that seniors need, and there are a lot of seniors that can't find afford, uh, affordable housing. So I would hope that you take a robust look at the maintain the funding for affordable housing and make it a little easier for seniors to eat. The other thing is, I don't, I don't know who, who does it, but the, um, when a senior goes to buy groceries, there's a thing about um, some seniors, if they get $1 over what the be budget is for uh, food stamps, they've lost, and yet their condition hasn't changed. $740 a month is not a lot when you're taking 30% uh, of that. And then I've got seniors that pay a lot for their uh, medicine. And then some seniors, they have a car. In Maryland, you have to have a car to get around. You can't always depend on metro access because most of the time they're late. And then you miss your doctor's appointment. And then you got to reschedule. Seniors have a hard time navigating uh, the internet. I got a problem navigating my phone. I got a phone, in, and the only thing I do, I get calls and, and, I, um, and I receive calls. Believe it or not, I learned two years ago that texting was typing. I stay away from stuff like that because 
every time you turn around, somebody's hacking your phone or they're hacking something. We seem to appreciate the fact that you have housing, but senior housing, it needs to be a lot more. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Final speaker on this panel, Peter Dale. Well, I'm looking at you guys. One job ahead of y'all. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. Whew. But everything's important, I've heard. Everything's important, I've heard. School's important. Autism's important. Uh, it's all important. And I guarantee you what I'm talking about is important and it's a need. And my name is Peter Daigle. It's, I'm from, me and my wife moved here and we live in an affordable housing, senior citizen home, nothing but old folks. Sometimes I wish I could see somebody young, you know. You know, some crazy, you get different when you're old. I see myself, you know. But anyway, I live in Charter House, and, and, and I'm here, to, and I love it there. I mean, uh, we moved here to be here with our boys because our health is declining. And uh, my wife's even declining worse. She's in a wheelchair. She had cancer. Now she's got lymphedema in her legs. And, and then me, I got this balance problem. I got water in my brain. I could my balance all over the place and not to mention my knees and everything else. And... Texting, I text my voice text because my hand shakes so much I can't put text. My goodness, I, I couldn't hit ABC. But anyway, I lost my place, but it's not really. I want to talk to you about it. You know, uh, I moved here, and, and and my sons, both of my sons, they will work here, and that's why we wanted to come here. At least here, we get to see them all the time. We left the thousands and thousands of people home in Mobile, Alabama, and New Orleans, Louisiana, where we're from. But uh, but we hear, and, and the big thing for you guys is when I one thing I hear a lot of, oh you live in Montgomery County, you lucky, they take care of you in Montgomery County. So man, that's even a little bit more pressure on y'all now, huh? Uh, <laughs> didn't mean it, but it, I mean it's true. People tell me that all the time. You lucky, you live in uh, it's a great county. They look out for you. Well, look after us. Uh, we make about twenty three hundred dollars a month. But after rent, it's kind of like like some of these other people say, are you going to pay the car note? Nah, shit, we paid them last month. We skipped the car note. We'll, we'll, we'll pay this note and this note. And then, you know, and you figure out, you go down, you can't go over two months because you learn all this stuff. Because you can't. Because that's when they really get you. Uh, but you got to play it. You know, you play the, pay you this, pay you that, you know. And we all here. And it, and we appreciate it. I'm a baby boomer, you know. We didn't have, I've been working since I was 10 years old, unfortunately. Nine Catholic family, you know, New Orleans, we had a Catholic family, you know. I got my motion here. I may pray for y'all tomorrow. I'm going to pray for y'all because y'all got a job. I really do. And uh, but, but I've been working all my life. And uh, shouldn't you get something out of it, you know? I, I want a little... I know we're three minutes up, but I got, uh, I want to have this thing called the last chapter, and that's me, my last chapter in my life. Help me make it a good one. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad that you and your wife moved here to be with your boys. Well, we love uh, it so far. We're, the Cole Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try to fix a lot of things. I'm not sure we're going to be able to fix that. Our next panel, Adam Pinchuk, Kristen Walsh, Allison Fultz, Sarav Chowdhury, and Daniel Conte.
All right, tough act to follow, but Adam Pinchuk, when you're ready, you have three minutes. That is a tough act to follow, and I'll do my best. Uh, good evening, Council President Friedson and members of the Council. My name is Adam Pinchuk, and I'm here today because affordable housing transformed my life. Tonight, I'm here calling upon the Council to support funding for county programs that preserve and expand what should be a basic human right, affordable, safe housing. I am a native of Montgomery County, and while I have lived here most of my life, I did live out of state for several years before returning back in 2013. When I came back, I was extremely income limited and had to resort to living with friends and family for numbers, a number of years. In 2020, after being on the wait list for over five years, I was fortunate enough to obtain a housing voucher. And when I received that voucher, it was a turning point in my life, and I would like to share with you why. My mother suffers from dementia, and as her condition has worsened, I moved in with her in order to take care of her. After leaving her job due to her declining health, she had to move into a studio apartment in Montgomery County, but I was determined to stay with her and caretake for, caretake for her even in those difficult living conditions. But being the sole caretaker for a parent takes a toll on a person. I wanted to continue caring for my mother, but our living situation made care, taking care of her even more challenging. When I received a voucher, it allowed me to afford a place of my own that was close enough so that I could still take care of her. Absent the voucher, I would eventually be faced with the choice of continuing to live with my mother at the expense of my own well-being or leaving Montgomery County and living too far to actually take care of her. Having a voucher meant I didn't have to choose between my mother and the county where I have a job, where her supports are, and where my supports are. Having an affordable place to live has been transformative for me as it is for many others. It empowers individuals from all different backgrounds who are experiencing housing insecurity to change their lives. I am one of the fortunate ones, but we must do more for people by making affordable housing a priority in this year's budget. Please do everything you can to provide funding for affordable housing. Before I conclude, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to use this platform to ask the council members to look into addressing the challenges faced by voucher holders in placing their vouchers in Montgomery County. It is a pressing issue that warrants attention and action and doesn't actually cost the county additional money. Discrimination against voucher holders not only perpetuates inequality, but also exacerbates issues of housing insecurity. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kristen Walsh. Kristen Walsh. I hope to be as charming and cute as some of the other people in the panel, so pray for me. Okay. Uh, good evening, County Council members. My name is Kristen Walsh, and I am the full-time school counselor at Twinbrook Elementary in Rockville. I have had the privilege to serve this amazing community for almost six years. I am here to testify on behalf of our students and families to advocate for a linkages to learning site at our school. Our students and families are resilient, loving, and extremely capable. Food insecurity, housing concerns, financial hardship, trauma, and inequity are significant barriers to student achievement and well-being. My role as a school counselor at that school functions differently than other places in the county. I spend most of my days managing or de-escalating unsafe student behavior, conducting behavior threat assessments, suicide assessments, and responding to calls for classroom support. Our school is grateful to have a half-time counselor and a community school designation, yet our students need and deserve more. From 2021 to 2022 school year up through January of 2024, the Twinbrook Counseling Team has provided the following student services. 1,899 student contacts, 399 classroom lessons, we've completed 299 holiday giving project referrals, and we've conducted over 25 crisis center referrals. Our students and families who need intensive support deserve dedicated programming to help meet their needs, which allows school staff to be more available and accessible to the student body at large. Twinbrook is the only Title I school in the city of Rockville. 
Maryvale Elementary is also in Rockville and currently has a linkages program. Data from the 22-23 school year indicates the farm rate at Maryvale was 52% with an ELD rate of 20%. Meanwhile, Twinbrook's farm rate is 72% with an ELD rate of 38%. Without linkages to learning, we are trying to piece together what our families need through myself and various other staff members. A dedicated linkages to learning therapist and care manager is essential for our Tigers to thrive. It's time for Twinbrook Elementary and we are grateful for your support. The most impactful way to support your constituents is to invest in their children's education and emotional well-being. When Twinbrook wins, everybody wins. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Allison Fultz. Good evening members of the Montgomery County Council and President Friedson, who's also my council member, Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the county's proposed FY25 operating budget in support of robust funding for Montgomery Parks. My name is Allison Ishihara Fultz and I'm a member of the board of Meadowbrook Foundation Incorporated. Meadowbrook is a 501c3 organization whose mission is education through horsemanship. With me this evening are Jessica Leonardi, our executive director, and my fellow board members um, Jesse Martin, Shelley Trimble, and Julia Creighton. We are tenants and stewards of the historic Parks Department owned Meadowbrook Stables in Rock Creek Park in Chevy Chase through the park's first public-private partnership. Meadowbrook Stables provides regular lessons throughout the year to over 300 adult and child riders. We teach complete horsemanship so that all students develop a thorough grounding in horse care and receive meticulous instruction in technically refined and sympathetic riding techniques. We also order regular program, um, offer regular programs to community-based groups, including the Girl Scouts and the YMCA, to introduce children to horses through barn tours, hands-on horse care, and riding lessons. As those of us who spend time with horses appreciate, the connection between humans and equines teaches us responsibility and empathy and provides a new lens on the world. Meadowbrook's mission is to introduce as many people as possible to this unique and mutually rewarding relationship. Most importantly, our home is Rock Creek Park and our facilities are open to the public during operating hours. This provides a rare opportunity for anyone to explore the grounds, visit with the horses, and observe horses relaxing with their herd mates or being ridden depending on the time of day. We welcome non-riding visitors and it's a rare weekend when I don't have the chance to chat with passers-by and introduce them to one of Meadowbrook's horses or ponies. This gives just a small glimpse of the value of the parks to life in Montgomery County. Being able to spend time in our parks got us all through the pandemic. The programs offered by Montgomery County Parks and affiliated organizations like Meadowbrook Stables are varied and outstanding. In contrast to virtually all other agencies across county government, the county executive's proposed operating budget reduces parks requested increase by some two-thirds or about $4 million. This falls short of a same services budget and would require cuts to parks operations, maintenance and services budget, hampering parks ability to maintain its facilities and remain accessible to all county residents and visitors. In light of the proven value the parks represent in maintaining the great quality of life we enjoy in Montgomery County, this proposal is frankly confounding. We at Meadowbrook Stables are proud to serve as partners with the parks and county in preserving a valuable historic research as a living enterprise. And we urge the County Council to increase Montgomery Park's budget at least to parity on a percentage basis concomitant with park sister agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we move to the next speaker, there was a key fob for a car that was found on the first floor security desk. If anybody left their key fob, please come and see the clerk at the front of the room. And if anybody is watching, uh, please come back and see the clerk or message or contact the county council and we will ensure that we return it to you. Thank you. Uh, with that, next speaker, Saurav Chowdhury. Testing. Good evening, members of the County Council. My name is Saurav Chaudhary, and I'm here to testify in support of funding for affordable housing, especially affordable home ownership. 
16 years ago, my family was able to purchase our first home in Burtonsville, thanks to Habitat for Humanity. Before that, we were renting in Silver Spring, and owning a home seemed to be out of reach, despite both my parents working two jobs. But then my dad found Habitat, and we were able to purchase our first home, and I got my first room. But in any case, we were able to purchase our first home without interest, which also coincides with our religious principles. Purchasing a home in 2008 was about more than just having to not rent anymore. My dad was diagnosed with cancer in 2011, just a few years after we purchased our home. Having a stable place to call home, especially for my dad, despite uh, or with his uh, diagnosis, provided him a sense of peace that we were going to be okay, because he knew he was running out of time. Uh, and he passed away two years after. My family and I were able to cope a little bit better because of um, the emotional and financial security that affordable housing provided us with. An affordable mortgage meant not being tied down to car loans, student loans, credit card loans, essentially the crippling debt that you know the, most of the US population is experiencing. Instead, we were able to save up for a second car. I was able to continue my college education without interruption, without mounting student loan debts. This in turn set into motion some of the exciting milestones that came afterwards. I was able to buy my own house. I was able to give my mom an all-you-can garden buffet. I was able to provide luxury housing for chickens and etc. So a lot of exciting things came out as I was up on my feet. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away from my testimony, it's this. Affordable, affordable housing doesn't just help the first gener generation uh, who are housed immediately. It sets the stage for the children to achieve financial security, peace of mind, and experience growth. It enables individuals to not just survive, but to live, thrive, and prosper. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Daniel Conte. Uh, is it working? Uh, uh, hello, members of the County Council. Uh, I'm Daniel Conte, a Seneca Valley High School student, and, uh, and I'm a member of Young People for Progress. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you today. I'm requesting you all add money to the MCPS proposed budget to maintain FY24 funding of current restorative justice coaches and specialists for FY25. In schools across the county, many students face unfair punishments without the chance to understand and learn from their mistakes. Without a chance to reflect on their actions, they're more likely to repeat them, leading, leading to more serious consequences. That's why restorative justice is so important in our schools. For example, a classmate of mine was outright suspended without being questioned due to another group of students who attacked her, all stating she, uh, all stating, all stating she was provoking them and asking for it. Without this reflection period, the students who harmed her will likely repeat said actions because they don't understand why their actions were harmful. An RJ coach or specialist can help make that realization. Mistakes that students make when they are young result in more disciplinary action, which will increase their chances of being arrested or funneled into the school to prison pipeline. We need restorative justice to stop cases like this from happening. Restorative justice addresses conflicts and focuses on communication and finding solutions that benefit everyone involved. It goes beyond just punishing students and, hel and helps them understand the impact of their actions and how to make things right. When restorative justice is implemented with fidelity, suspension rates decrease in students, particularly black students, who often face dis dis disproportionate discipline are treated more fairly. In RJ-focused sco schools, black, black student suspension drops by 41%. Rather than invest in such incredible results, we are facing cuts to the program. There is currently one stipend restorative justice coach at every school who must work extracurricular hours on top of their full-time job. If stipends are cut as is currently proposed, it will, even it will be even harder for them to provide consistent support. The budget also proposes the cutting proposes cutting the RJ specialist to just six full-time positions. Students, students would have even fewer opportunities to turn to a trusted adult for guidance and support when they make mistakes. Investing in a restorative justice coach for every school in our county is not just about addressing disciplinary issues, it's about investing in the future of our students and, cra and creating more than, sorry, 
more, a more just and equitable learning environment for all. By providing students with the support they need to learn from their mistakes and grow into responsible individuals, we can foster a positive school culture that benefits our entire community. Please add more money to the MCPS budget so we can maintain so we can maintain the current level of funding for restorative justice coaches and specialists. Thank you for considering this important proposal. Thank you very much. Our final in-person panel, Rick Callahan, Carlene Butt Pruitt. Jeffrey Brown, Sedyana Bika, and Sally Murek. Rick Callahan. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. For the record, my name is Rick Callahan, co-chair of Interact and executive director of Compass. My testimony tonight is on behalf of the 41 Interact service providers. This coalition urges the county council to fully support the DD supplement by adding $315,933 to what is proposed in the county exec's FY25 operational budget. Interact wants to thank the county executive and the county council for the many years of support. Because of that support, Interact providers and FY23 provided over 3,500 unique home and community-based services that include residential, day, employment, and personal supports. In addition to these services, people with disabilities also received behavioral supports, nursing supports, and newer services such as peer mentoring and housing support services. The number of services and the number of service hours being provided by staff has steadily increased over the past few years. The 3% proposed amount for the DD supplement in the county exact operational budget addresses the proposed increase in the minimum wage. However, it does not address the rate at which DD services are growing to meet the needs of Montgomery County citizens with developmental disabilities. We all know the cost of doing business is higher in the county than in the rest of the state. The turnover rates may remain high, but have steadily increased from 42% in FY19 to 28% in FY23. While providers have steadily increased DSP wages on average to over $18 an hour in FY23, the, liberal, the livable wage for two adults, one working, no children, is $34.86 an hour. As minimum wage increases, it lifts the market expectations. Business sectors must also increase their wages to remain competitive. The supplement supports providers to bring services to the county to benefit our citizens. The supplement is a critical factor in the range and variety of service options for citizens with developmental disabilities. Our, great, our single greatest threat is the continual workforce crisis, bar none. All the strategic investments of time and talent and champion transition and use and developing the capacity to eliminate waiting lists. All the great ideas from the County Council, the IDD Commission, DHSS, and Interact will never see the light of day without a stable quality workforce. And that workforce needs and deserves strategic investments. We are confident with the support of the County Executive and County Council that anything is possible. Again, Interact thanks you for all your support. Thank you, Carlene Butt Pruitt. President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and honor members of the County Council, thank you for having us here today to let us speak our piece or share with you our stories. So my name is Carlene Butt Pruitt, and I serve as the Executive Vice President of SEIU Local 500. I want to thank you for supporting the County Executive's budget for Montgomery College, and I ask that you address some of the shortcomings in the County Executive's budget for Montgomery County Public Schools. The budget is inadequate to fully support the needs of our students, our staff, and our community. In the budget submitted by MCPS, the superintendent and the president of the Board of Education noted that the request will allow MCPS to provide our students and families with what they need and will continue to address the opportunity and access gaps that have exacer been exacerbated by the pandemic. It is our responsibility 
as leaders in Montgomery County to establish an environment where our staff are able to ensure that our students are community, college, and career ready. The existing staffing shortages have impacted our day-to-day -day operations in MCPS. Imagine being a paraeducator assigned to help specific students with accommodations, and you come in on a daily basis to do that, and you find there's not enough substitute teachers. So you find out you are the teacher on record for that day. Imagine that happening day after day, and knowing that the children you are supposed to support and provide accommodations to are not getting those accommodations. Or imagine being an overworked school administrative secretary in our elementary schools, having to help figure out how to assist with classroom coverage, recess coverage, providing backup to the health room, while attempting to do all the many tasks required to daily keep the school main office running, which includes granting people access to the building. Picture being the admin secretary who has the largest job description of any job description published on the MCPS webpage. Picture yourself as a maintenance support professional who has several repair work orders that need to be completed and doesn't have someone to hold the ladder or appear to help get the work done. In MCPS, we're already seeing increased workloads, burnout, and decreased morale. Staff are imperative to our students' success, and they set the tone for learning. The quality of education received by our students is a consequence of adopting a budget that does not adequately fund our school system. The existing budget shortfalls continue to result in losing qualified support professionals and educators to surrounding counties and private sector businesses where their skill sets are valued and they get paid for the hours and the workload they carry. By not fully funding MCPS budget, students and staff who serve them will be impacted. Our students' learning conditions are the working conditions in which our staff operate. Thank you. Next speaker, Jeffrey Brown. Good evening, and thank you for granting me the opportunity to speak before you today. My name is Jeff Brown, and I serve as the principal of Roberto Clemente Middle School in Germantown. Over the past nine years, it has been my honor to lead a vibrant community that mirrors the diversity and resilience of Germantown itself. My dedication to Montgomery County Public Schools spans 21 years, a journey that has taken me through various roles across Poolsville, Damascus, Richard Montgomery, Wooten, Seneca Valley, and now at Roberto Clemente Middle School. My commitment to our, our schools is a family legacy, inspired by my parents and aunts who retired from MCPS, laying the groundwork for my path in education. This past year has been challenging, marked by an unprecedented number of administrative retirements and transitions. From my firsthand experience, this trend is largely due to the delicate balance we strive to maintain daily, the commitment to our students' success against a backdrop of constrained resources. Just today, we face a stark example of this imbalance with nine staff members absent and only three substitute teachers available. This shortage forced me and many other staff in the building to step in to cover classes, sacrificing valuable planning time. Our district continues to lag behind neighboring districts in terms of compensation, resulting in the loss of talented new and existing administrators. At the heart of ensuring our school's safety is the imperative to fill every position with the most qualified individuals. Moreover, the comprehensive support for everyone's wellness through restorative justice coaches, social workers, and school psychologists is crucial. Although fully funding the budget will not immediately solve all resource disparities, it is a critical step towards closing the gap. The paradox of wellness in education looms large. We expect our schools to be all-encompassing support systems, yet we offer limited support to the educators bearing this weight. Despite recent scrutiny, I can attest to the dedication of countless administrators working tirelessly to enhance student achievement. Remember, the conditions under which our staff work directly influence our students' learning environments. To aspire for excellence from our team, we must provide them with the necessary resources to achieve it. When there's a tragedy in the community, when someone is hurt or safety is compromised, no one's asking me what my salary is. When uh, the school adds an autism program and we have students and families feeling success for the very first time, no one's asking how much the chairs and tables cost. When a child learns to read or learns English, 
No one's asking why I have four ESOL teachers. I'm before you as a testament to the dedication that runs deep within MCPS, appealing for your support to fully fund the proposed budget. Together we make a substantial difference in the lives of our students and educators. Thank you for considering this pivotal investment in the future of our community. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Satyana Bika. Hello, my name is Satyana Bika, and I am a sophomore at Wien High School. I urge the County Council to add funding to the proposed MCPS budget in order to maintain the fiscal year 2024's funding for restorative justice specialists and coach stipends, not cut it. I initially didn't know anything about restorative justice or RJ, but I began to learn more in my work to improve school climate with young people for progress. When I first heard about RJ, I was skeptical. I thought that if restorative justice isn't widely known, then it just wasn't important. But as I learned more, I realized that I've been applying RJ practices like personal accountability into my academic life. I'd like to share some words about RJ from someone who practices it at my school. Last Wednesday, I had the opportunity to interview we at high school's former restorative justice coach, Mr. Bolton. He taught in MCPS for 18 years and at Wien High School for five years as an honors biology teacher. He said that a school is like a sports team. All of us, the students and teachers, as well as the players and coaches, have certain roles and expectations. However, we can't work together efficiently if some of us get kicked out, aka suspended from the team. It's important to create a culture of trust and open, honest communication to prevent misunderstandings and conflicts. Restorative justice also requires a level of personal accountability. Continuing with the sports analogy, say you didn't stretch well during a warm-up, which may cause you to fall and get injured during the game. That should be on you, right? Although a player is ultimately responsible for what they do with their body, a good coach can spot a bad stretch as you are doing it and help you correct yourself. However, an ineffective coach wouldn't even notice the bad stretch, or even worse, notice and leave the problem unaddressed. If this was a problem in the classroom, the restorative justice coach could get all parties together, the teachers, the students, and their parents to better understand how they contributed to the unwanted outcome and how they can avoid it in the future. Restorative justice is the key to student self-sufficiency and agency as they have the opportunity to proactively make change with new understanding and better relationship with their schools. Teachers need restorative justice to advance racial justice at MCPS. We the students need restorative justice to resolve conflicts and make school a place that we want to go to every day. We need you, the county council, to fund RJ so that we can succeed. Please add funding to the proposed MCPS budget so that we can keep FY24 funding for restorative justice specialists and coach stipends. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Our final in-person <laughs> speaker of the day showing great patience and perseverance, Sally Merrick. <laughs> to start over, okay. Good evening, President Friedson and Vice President Stewart and Council Members. My name is Sally Murick and I'm here to speak against the proposed reduction in the MCPS FY25 operating budget. As supporting services employees, uh, as a supporting services employee of MCPS, I serve as the paraeducator program manager. Daily, I see the growing needs of our students and the dwindling human resources needed to support them. As you are well aware, our students are presenting with greater challenges, not just in academic achievement, but also in social, emotional, and economic needs. One of the best supports we can offer them is consistency. The ne they need to see and build relationships with adults they can depend on and trust. This means having paraeducators and teachers who will be there from semester to semester and year to year. Sadly, this is not happening. MCPS has a recruitment and retention problem. The underlying reason for this is lower pay than people can earn in the private sector. Recruiting and retaining good qualified employees who are dedicated to our students is the foundation of our work. We cannot educate and care for our students if we don't have qualified staff and if we don't have enough staff. 
Many supporting service positions have remained unfilled for more than a year, which has stretched the current staff to work harder until many decide it is too much and they leave us, further exacerbating our staffing crisis. And now the proposed budget seeks to reduce funding? This cycle needs to end. There was a time when our excellent negotiated benefits would attract qualified employees, even if wages were lower than on the com community marketplace, but today we need more. We need to focus spending on good wages, which will attract the people we need who are qualified and dedicated to our mission. Now I understand that you as the County Council don't have purview over how the budget is spent, the MCPS budget is spent, but you do have control over the final budget provisions which will allow us to continue to negotiate for the necessary wage allocations towards proper recruitment, hiring, retainment, and training with continuing professional development for the MCPS supporting services staff and teachers. We need to support and educate our children. This proposed budget falls short, and I ask for your support in restoring the vital funding the necessary to improve student learning conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who joined us this evening. A full house indeed. We're going to move to virtual, starting with Kim Hayden. and I'm representing the county's Animal Services Advisory Committee. I'm speaking in support of the county executive's recommended fiscal year 2025 operating budget for the Office of Animal Services. He is recommending the addition of three critically needed positions, including a foster and rescue coordinator and registered vet veterinary technician that will greatly enhance the life-saving mission of OAS. The additional foster and rescue coordinator role is a critical position for handling capacity issues at the shelter when they become overcrowded and will significantly contribute to the efficient and organized placement of animals into homes. An additional foster and rescue coordinator ensures the animal's well-being and alleviates the burden on existing resources. The inclusion of registered veterinary technicians will play a pivotal role in supporting medical procedures, including spay and neuter surgeries, allowing animals to leave the shelter in a shorter time frame. As professionals licensed by the state of Maryland, registered veterinary technicians possess specific privileges under the law that can only be assigned to these positions and licensed veterinarians. The additional registered vet technicians will support the reduction of the common backlog of surgeries in the shelter. Furthermore, we would like to highlight a recommendation that was central in Maddie's Fund report in October of 2023. This report emphasized the importance of preventative measures to keep animals out of the shelter, such as a robust, robust spay and neuter initiative that re reaches into the community, particularly communities that are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Therefore, we hope to see additional future support from the Council on community spay and neuter initiatives as well. We urge you to consider and prioritize the allocation of re resources necessary to fulfill these staffing requirements. By doing so, we can not only enhance the effectiveness of our county's animal services, but also actively contribute to a healthier and more sustainable animal, animal community. These requests align with priorities set forth by the Office of Animal Services and recommendations provided in the Maddie's Million Pet Challenge Consult further reinforcing the urgency and necessity of these additions to our animal services. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, Melanie Stickle. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. President. My name is Melanie Stickle, and I'm here as the chair of the Countywide Recreation and Parks Advisory Board, here to extend our full support of the County Executive's proposed budget for the Recreation Department. However, we have concerns regarding the Parks Department's proposed funding, which regrettably falls short in crucial areas. We strongly urge you to increase Parks funding by an additional $4 million. While we acknowledge the County Executive's efforts, the Parks budget lacks essential funding for critical enhancements and fails to provide adequate resources for the maintenance and staffing of the 419 parks in Montgomery County. These parks are not merely patches of green, they are vital community spaces that require proper upkeep to serve our residents effectively. As we anticipate the opening of new parks this year, including White Flick Civic Green, 
Broad Run Stream Valley Park and Caroline Freeland Urban Park, it's imperative that we allocate sufficient resources to ensure they are safe and regularly maintained. Our recreation and parks facilities are more than just amenities. They are lifelines for many, including our vulnerable populations, whether it be a low-income family and our elderly or the disabled. We cannot neglect the maintenance and um, with GO staff. Um, it'll just jeopardize, jeopardize these facilities. I commend this council for its past initiatives aimed at promoting access to our parks and recreation facilities, and particularly for these marginalized groups. However, to fully realize these initiatives, additional funding for staffing and administrative support is essential. Specifically, we need two additional recreational program members, which were not included in this proposal. Our board strongly believes increasing available marketing funds available to the recreation department so that we can effectively communicate the valuable services and programs offered by the recreation department to county residents. The outpouring of community testimonials underscores the profound impact of our recreation department services and their immense value placed on access to our parks and facilities. It is my hope that you will join us in prioritizing the well-being and enjoyment of Montgomery County residents by increasing funding for both the Department of Recreation and our Parks Department. Thank you for your unwavering dedication and consideration of increasing the budget for both departments. Thank you. Next speaker, Chandra Raja. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Chandra Raja, and I come to you uh, today with a deep concern regarding the proposed $4 million budget cut to Montgomery Parks. As a parent of a high-functioning autistic child, I have experienced firsthand the invaluable support provided by programs within Montgomery Parks, and I fear that these cuts will significantly impact families like mine. Uh, last summer, my son, uh, who struggles with anxiety in group settings, participated in a summer camp organized by Montgomery Parks. As a parent, I was really apprehensive about how he would navigate the camp environment, given his challenges with social interaction and executive functioning. However, thanks to the dedicated support staff provided by Montgomery Parks, my son was able to engage in the camp activities and form meaningful connections with his peers. Uh, the presence uh, of the support staff who understood his needs and provided individualized assistance made all the difference. They not only helped him overcome his initial anxiety, but also empowered him to actively participate in the group activities, fostering his social skills and even boasting his self-confidence. By end of the summer, my son was eagerly looking forward to each day at, at the camp and the positive impact on his overall well-being was evident. He's looking forward to re-attending the camp again this year. Uh, it is crucial to recognize that children with autism spectrum often require additional support to thrive in recreational and social settings. Cutting funding to programs that provide such support would be detrimental not only to these children, but also to their families who rely on these services for their children's development and happiness. I urge the Council to reconsider this proposed budget cut and prioritize the funding of programs within the parks that cater to the diverse needs of our community, including those of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Investing in these programs is not just an expenditure, it's an investment in the future of the children and the inclusivity of our community. Uh, thank you for considering my testimony tonight and for your commitment to the well-being of all the residents of the county. Thank you. I appreciate it, and we appreciate it. I don't believe Zoe is on, so we're going to move on to Jane lyons Reader. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about funding for affordable housing and the planning initiatives that will help the county to create more opportunities for affordable housing. Um, as you know, and you heard from many other speakers tonight, Montgomery County faces a acute affordable housing crisis and it affects the vast majority of residents and workers and it spans from our urban hubs all the way out to the agricultural reserve and to meet this demand the county must add over 21,000 homes by 2030 and i'm grateful to this count this council and the county executive for your work to achieve record levels of funding for affordable housing and i urge you to continue to prioritize housing in the fy25 operating budget due to higher costs all around on producing and preserving housing a dollar in the hiff today doesn't go as far as it used to unfortunately montgomery county should not be a place where you have to be either incredibly wealthy 
or sacrifice well over a third of your income to find a healthy, affordable home for your family. This crisis requires public intervention to both unlock market rate housing construction that we have limited for too long, as well as public intervention to ensure that our housing market serves everybody. To this end, I also urge you to fully fund Montgomery planning so that they can continue to work on projects and master plans that open up a path to creating more communities where everyone can live affordably and sustainably. Although master plans operate on a long time horizon, if we put off planning initiatives today, we'll miss out on opportunities that exist now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liz Kruger. Hi, uh, good evening members of the County Council. My name is Liz Kruger. It is great to be with you very late into this evening. While some of you may know me for my role at Interfaith Works, I am testifying tonight on behalf of the Progress Place Neighborhood Work Group to request that the Council approve the recommended funding for three peer support specialists to be based out of Progress Place. This neighborhood group started six years ago, and it is comprised of multiple Progress Place stakeholders to include the co-located nonprofits, Shepherd's Table and IW, but also representatives from our partners, such as Silver Spring Regional Services, Chamber of Commerce, Montgomery Preservation, Urban District, Behavioral Health Services, SEP, and so many other community entities that I do not have time to mention, but that have collaborated on this and that we deeply appreciate. As Progress Place continues to see the exponential growth of guests coming for meals, day program services, and shelter, so has this neighborhood group observed a significant increase in persons in downtown Silver Spring who are experiencing acute mental health crisis. The peers we are requesting are part of a neighborhood engagement strategy, which will include in-reach case managers at Progress Place. However, this ideally bilingual team of peer support specialists will cover different shifts throughout the day and using their lived expertise and extensive behavioral health training, they will engage persons in crisis, not only within the walls of Progress Place, but also outside of it. This primarily includes the parking lot, where as many of you are aware, there were multiple violent incidents last year, a majority which could be attributed to the co-occurring mental health and substance abuse symptoms of those involved. Additionally, the peer support specialists will have the flexibility to serve community members in the surrounding neighborhood of Progress Place when needed and in collaboration with outreach teams. They will spend dedicated time with our community members, building trust, learning their story, connecting them to individualized behavioral health resources, and most importantly, validating their personhood, showing them that they are not throwaway people as they have so often been treated. Finally, I want to highlight that this is a relational strategy about cultivating hope in individuals from which we believe the best public safety outcomes for our community will follow. As we explore the spikes in crime and other challenges faced in Silver Spring and all over Montgomery County, it is important for me to close by saying that neighborhoods are not sustainably safer and better because we are tougher on crime. Our neighborhoods are genuinely safer when we know all of our neighbors' names and even more so when we trust and understand them. Thank you for your time as always, and I'll see you again next week. Thank you. I don't believe our other speakers who have registered are on Zoom. And so with that, with deep, deep appreciation and much gratitude to our incredible staff who have been working overtime to make sure that this went smoothly uh, and uh, an appreciation to everybody who turned out tonight. This public hearing is now closed. We will be returning tomorrow afternoon for one final, the fifth public hearing during the budget, providing an opportunity for every resident to be able to weigh in on our $7.1 billion recommended operating budget. That is a virtual public hearing tomorrow, April 10th at 1.30. And with that, we are adjourned, and we will see everybody at 1.30 tomorrow.